That works. <laughs> that works. Uh, welcome all to the November 11th uh, Veterans Day um, edition of the ARB. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask for the roll call. Ms. Rose, please. Mr. Scott? Here. Mr. Hellman? Here. Ms. Krosky? Here. Ms. Strasser? Here. And Chairman Heyer? Here. Uh, the meeting will take a vote on the meeting minutes from the October 14th, 2021 meeting of the ARB with corrections, I believe, as of today, November 11th, correct? Yes, but, um, I've had several corrections and they've been forwarded and updated and actually on one already. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Move for approval, the minutes. Second. Second. Have the roll. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Ms. Brodsky? Yes. Strasser? Yes. Chairman Heyer? Yes. Uh, having approved the meeting minutes, this is now a period for public comment. Uh, this is the opportunity for any Bexley resident to offer a brief comment on any relevant issue of general public policy and irrespective of whether the resident has standing or on an agenda item. Standing is defined as having a direct relationship to an agenda item by virtue of proximity or financial impact. Is there anyone present that would like to come forward for any public comment? Yes, sir, please come forward. There is no being sworn in for public comment, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct. You're free to speak. Could we have your name, please? Uh, James Harris. James Harris, thank you. 67 South Parkview Avenue. Uh, I'm here to uh, ask the board to consider uh, voting against the demolition permit on the 261 South Columbia. Actually, that I'm sorry to interrupt, but that is uh, an item on the agenda and not of general uh, comment. So, and, and in, but in general, I would, ask, I would ask the board to consider its policies with regard to demolition. If I will not be allowed to speak later, uh, I was told that uh, I may or may not have uh, standing. If you don't have standing, then you would not. For that particular application, I, I realize there's a notification uh, issue with residents that are within 200 feet of a property. However, that notification, I don't believe, prevents or precludes a Bexley citizen from speaking to any board. You can speak to us on in, in, on gen, in general terms about general policy of the board at this time. So, if there's aspects that you would like to bring forward about historic preservation or about uh, the demo ordinance in general, you're free to speak on that now. Thank you, I will. Uh, how many minutes would you like to cut it off? Uh, we have a long agenda tonight, so I would just ask that you keep it as brief as possible. I think it's pretty clear it actually does not have an official uh, historic district or historic review board process with cheat, uh, unlike German Village or the state section of Arlington uh, or around the country. Uh, there is a a speed bump, a historic review process, and I believe a letter is often submitted in uh, cases. However, uh, I would say, uh, like repeating what Warren Buffett would say, you don't ask a, a barber if you need a haircut. Uh, I don't believe that historic societies or historic experts are often involved. Uh, more often, it's builders, owners, and architects. In general, I would say the estate section of Bexley probably relates to the old Bullet Park, which was a 20 year neighborhood before Bexley, in the north and west, from Dryden to Maryland, from Parkview to Drexel, including a bit of Dawson and Ash. And Cheese is a historic home that I believe gives Bexley its character. <clears throat> Not on the outer bell, but new land, and new homes, and open plans. We're a historic green tree line city. And every time we knock down a, a 1928 house and build a 2022 house, we lose a little more of our character. 
my family with us downtown being raised completely. What we have left, the Torrance Village, German Village, the Near East Side, and more importantly, with regard to state homes, in fact, Broad Street has been demolished. We've got brand new Old Arlington, Marble Cliff, which used to be called Arlington, and the estate part of that state. So, all I'm asking for is uh, if I'm from speaking on any specific house, I ask you to step back and basically slow the roll. We've got a mania going on right now. And if our home is bought for 1.4 million and raised, it implies that's the value of the lot. We all ask ourselves would any old apart homes, million dollar homes, have any excess value? Over that price, you buy it a lot. If so, it'd be a very small percentage relative to the million dollar dollar park lot. If that's the measure, I can't see how almost any homes could be prevented from being demolished if the right architect and the right owner came forward proposing to spend one or two million dollars to build a new home. As a CFA, I, I do feel I'm qualified to speak on. Financial matters. Whether two million dollars of capital expenditures is invested, I personally don't believe two million will be added to a lot value of one point zero or one point four million in any particular demolition case. Finally, I don't know that in-depth historical review is being done. Do we know the names of architects? Do we know exactly the year that they were built? Any of the proposed demolition homes that have come up in front of you. Do we know the former owners were they prominent members of Columbus and Bexley Society? Old Bush homes, old Lazarus homes, other famous names of Columbus history. When they demolished, we clearly lost the ones downtown, and the less in Bexley try to preserve the uh, remaining historical homes. Try to be mindful of your time and uh, I've submitted to your officer on behalf of the board a letter with exhibits or in general review, also specific review with the item tonight. And I just look for you can uh, whether it's the ARB or the Sony Commission, I don't know how it all works, or the city council. I hope you'll uh, review these in a box. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your generous comments. I, I will comment uh, to you that these this issue is front and center for the Architecture Review Board. We have um, a historic preservation working group that is currently working on uh, documentation for the city of Bexley, which includes a lot of the information that you're talking about. This particular issue brings great anguish to you know people who are involved in this process. And I just want you to know that those comments are well taken. And uh, as we move forward in Bexley establishing historic preservation, which is, uh, and you know, we're in the process of working on that documentation, those kind of comments will definitely be kept in mind. In the meantime, we have a particular ordinance with particular rules to follow for demolition and for establishment of new structures in Bexley. And we have to follow those ordinances uh, as best we can, keeping in mind, you know, the value and the architectural character and history of the buildings that we have. So there's a process going on, and uh, I'm greatly heartened that there are residents like yourself uh, who also feel the same uh, and anguish over this issue. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you. And one last question. I, I don't know if the city knows I'm not here to appeal on anything, but there is this question of standing, and I'm familiar with the notification ordinance of 200 feet in general for demolitions or other similar work. Is there such an ordinance or case law or a pile of statute that prevents a, a citizen of the state of actually speaking on any particular issue and having that weighed as testimony? Or is this issue of notice, 200 feet notice, and the phrase standing, is that but that becomes some sort of mantra. I'm unclear on the legal point. Yeah. I just thought I'd I just ask city staff what you can tell us about that. It's specifically related to how it, how you are directly impacted by an individual case. I think the question is 
is it clear that notification and standing to speak are one and the same? He understands that he wasn't entitled to specific notice, but as a resident with the matter, are we certain that that is included because he doesn't get notice? <clears throat> Above and beyond being notified, if you're notified, you you're directly impacted by a case. But above and beyond that, I guess you would have to share with the board how you believe you are directly impacted by a case, even though you aren't within 200 feet. Can you direct him to a particular to the ordinance where it would where it would outline that? It may be in our policy. Uh, um, right, I would be happy to provide that. That's the way it has been handled in the past. I think we certainly it's back to you. It is, uh, um, I wouldn't mind if you meant to see my specific issue, but I'm going to be prevented. I think if it won't be considered later on the discussion and merits, I also understand that. Is the city attorney present? She she will be here for that individual case. She is here. She she doesn't want to participate in the meeting at this point um, due to conflicts with a case. So she has stepped away. <laughs> I, if I may. Okay, yeah, that, if, that sounds fair. I'd be happy to, to weigh in here. Uh, my understanding of how this works uh, is that items of general interest and so that's a fine line and so to speak in general about this issue right, which, which you have yeah. uh is probably in uh to speak specifically of this property and not have standing is not and and the reason for that they may that may sound unfair um but uh we also have gotten there by experience and so we'll have people that'll show up that'll be you know, at the far south end of the community and raise an issue with the house that, that whatever would happen with that or that property would have just no impact on them whatsoever. Uh, and so at some point you have to call it uh, and you have and you say it's a it's a relationship of what who is impacted pretty directly by what might happen on that property, either in terms of its mass, its size, its scale, its operation, its function, uh, or whatnot. That becomes obviously less of an argument if someone lives a mile, two miles uh, away in a corner of a community. So I think that's the basic distinction we try to operate with. So I hope that helps. And because we operate as a volunteer board for the city of Bexley, I would encourage you to always write letters to city council, um, to staff here at the city, and um, for concerned citizens in general, I would say that getting those letters in early in the process of you know something coming before us would be critical. Um, and but that is something that that you know the city attorney would have to and staff would have to determine whether it had standing, you know, for us to be able to access as the uh, ARB. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other public comments at this time of a general nature? Okay, let's move to old business. The first application is ARB 2151. Consent agenda. Oh, right, consent agenda item, sorry. So there were several items that during the pandemic, uh, we started consent agenda items for applications that um, staff felt uh, were ready to be passed and elicited the, um, the review of ARB prior to this meeting, which will help to expedite this meeting tonight. And those three applications, should I read them in, in order? Sure. Uh, application ARB 2170, the address is 2456 Sherwood. The applicant is Jamie Parrish and the owners are Bill and Elisa Litvin. Number two is application ARB 2171, address is 2549 Brentwood. The applicant is Amy Lauerhouse, and the owners are Barb and Steve Fishman. And the last number three, uh, BZAP uh, 2146, application number, address 2831 East Broad Street. The applicant is Gary Alexander Architect, and the owner is Kimberly Demond, Demond sorry. Um, 
Is there any comment from staff on those three items? Um, these were all pretty um, unanimously consented across the board. There were a couple of suggestions, and I just like on record that all the suggestions that were offered were accepted by the applicants and will be um, made in the application. Is there any further discussion from the board? Hearing none, we can we ask if right there's anyone here yes, in the presence? Um, if there's anyone in attendance who has standing for those, any of those three properties, we would ask you to come forward now if you wish to speak about those, any of those three. Uh, 2456 Sherwood, 2549 Brentwood, or 2831 East Broad. Yeah, Seeing none. Uh, then we can move to a consent agenda vote. So moved. Second. Uh, Ms. Rose, can we have the roll, please? Mr. Hallam? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Mr. Crofty? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Chairman Tyer? Yes. The consent agenda items have been approved. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Um, we have moved one agenda item on this list. Uh, yeah. So old business, old business as is as listed, but we have moved in new business uh, item H, which is uh, 81 North Drexel. We've moved that to the front of the new business agenda. Just wanted to make everyone aware of that. Anything else? Is that it? Okay, we'll move on with old business. Our first application tonight for old business is application number ARB 2151. The address is 2010 East Broad Street. The applicant is Brent Foley. The owner is the Catholic Diocese of Columbus. The applicant is requesting architectural review and approval of a certificate of appropriateness for the addition of a convocation center and the renovation of the lobby area attached to the existing building. We have the applicant come forward and be sworn in. State your name. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. Um, Karen, are you going to give a report for um, oh, yes. I, will, but I think first, before we do this particular project, I wanted to give everybody an update. Brent and I kind of planned this out last time, but they yes. had asked to be tabled. So we're going to do it because we have a very long agenda. We just want to show you quickly what was approved as master plan. Um, just by way of uh, reminder, this had come to all of this board for a recommendation to Lisa. Um, it was, there was no requirement for it to come back to you, but I'm very pleased to tell you that um, they, that St. Charles worked really hard with staff, with board members, comments, and really followed all the suggestions. So I just wanted to share that. Right? Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I would just add that thank you for all the comments on the consultant that they're talking about this week. A couple of this high level features did Incorporate pedestrian access to the broad street um, directly across the entrance to Wolf Park. So, when we have large events there, there would be a special duty officer who would show people to that entrance and went through. We also connected pedestrian access to the bridge across down the creek, uh, which is suggested. And then we come up with what we call, like to call the fraternal space. Uh, so, the new courtyard space is uh, intended in concept to be inspired by the courtyard space. Uh, from the original crowd school. That's kind of the high level stuff, but uh, very happy with where it's landed. What's in red there is what we've been talking about shortly. So I didn't talk about the state one. So we just wanted to do a little, I mean, if anyone has any questions, but I, I think all of you should be extremely pleased with how much. Yeah, one question. I, I guess uh, I, I would certainly say the progression from where we started in terms of something that had a dominant parking focus 
less a pedestrian focus, less a campus focus, and was maybe not as well organized as it could have been uh, a vast improvement. Uh, as we, so I appreciate that. My question would be, what of the site plan improvements that we see on this master plan are associated with the new building project? Um, so we we have completed the, the East parking lot project, which was not a part of this, but was uh, pre prerequisite to this project. And then the parking to the south is actually been approved as well through BZAP and we have engineering approval and we submitted for um, uh, the, the Tree and Garden Commission for that portion as well. So that, those are both either completed or underway. Uh, and then we will be um, doing the, uh, the grotto work as part of this project, as well as the additional parking along the drive. Uh, we will not be able to complete um, the courtyard at this time, but we will be prepping the site for the courtyard as a future project. So the, uh, it does relate to this project. There is a walkway off the Walters Commons that goes to the north. We will be connecting as a part of this project that walkway to our new entrance, uh, but we won't be creating the walkway all the way around. That would come at a later date to, to enclose that courtyard and finalize. Do that. you have a, is there, a, and maybe it's in the set and I missed it, is there a site plan that then is specific to phase one? Not completed yet. We add an engineer. Okay, because we'll obviously need to see what that is. Sure. So it's, since we're since what we're seeing is not what we'll get originally, and I understand that, uh, we have to know what the, what the, what is associated sure. within this project and its scope. Sure, and so the, what I will note too is that uh, one of the suggestions that was made to, was to uh, move the drive kind of to the, the west. Uh, and so the, the drive will be moved as part of this project as well. So the drive, as you see it there, uh, and the parking and all of those site components will be, will be done. It likely won't be, we don't know what the paving surfaces all will be at this time. Um, but all of the, so I would say all the, dri the, dri the drive and parking components of the project will be completed as part of this project. Uh, as it associates with the courtyard, it will be more like a quad at this point with um, access for, for cars to get up there for people that are in wheelchairs, but it'll be more of a lawn space at this moment, at this phase. Thank you. That helps describe it. You mentioned a bridge. Isn't there already a bridge existing, a pedestrian bridge? That's yes. So what we did was we actually, what we tried to do though, is create a pedestrian experience yes. from that bridge right. to the courtyard so that you're not uh, just dumping into a parking lot. And so cars will be able to see the students coming from that bridge more easily. Correct. Demarcation Correct. on Correct. the pavement and so Correct. forth. Correct. And I, I lied. I have another question. Um, and then associated landscaping that would be, I, I believe you've looked, uh, there's been landscaping approved for the front. Correct. Uh, has there been landscaping approved for the remainder of the access drive against the against Allen Creek going from kind of midpoint to uh, Clifton? Uh, it was not a condition of the zoning approval. Only, only the screening was a condition of the zoning approval, and that's what's in for submission. But will there be landscaping? In there will section? be landscaping associated with the project that's to be determined. I don't know, and I guess it's a question for city. We're under the, under the understanding that that does not require approval. Only all that requires approval is the, uh, the screening. Typically, the if there's new driveways being constructed, there's new grading that happens by definition. And then that's the time when landscaping is usually done. So uh, I'd recommend that we that you move ahead with your landscaping so that you have an area of finish. So new drive, yes. new landscape, uh, and, and that's on all sides. So you've already got it on your east side, you got it on your south side, uh, and to complete it on the west side would, I seem logical with that. Yes, so yes. Uh, the have to be, would yeah, be a the condition. to do all of that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the, I misunderstood the question. The intent is to do all that landscaping as part of the, the first well, phase. Is I, there is with it, condition on a plan. I think right. we need to have a plan approved. Then we can determine how much can be put in when, but we need a landscape plan. I guess my question to staff is, is that the purview well, of this board or not? I did reach out to Mr. Foley and, and they are planning to submit to the Tree and Public Garden Commission. I believe the record of decision simply calls out critical areas that have to be addressed as far as right. reading along broad but whatever else the Tree Public Garden Commission finds appropriate for the new design, I think that that will be discussed. Okay. All right, so we'll work through that, I guess, is our, okay. our intention. Yeah. So to clarify, that would not be coming to this board, that would be going to the Tree and Public Garden Commission, correct? Correct. Right. And we'd be happy to make all those necessary applications. Okay. okay. Appreciate your comments, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bokor, any uh, staff comments about the application? Yeah. 
So this application for the um, convocation center, which does match the site, the approved site plan, the approved master plan, um, was to be before us last month. And for reasons that Brent can you know get into or not, um, it was tabled by the applicant and not heard at all. Um, they uh, had some budgetary um, constraints, challenges, challenges, and you will find in online for this meeting a, a modified version of what was um, applied for last month. Um, Kathy, I think rightly so, suggested that we may want to look at both and have a backup approval for the um, first plan in case some funding comes in so that you have that all through. But what's before you tonight is um, the the new version which takes, I'm going to let Brett go into detail, but generally it takes away the cupola. Um, it takes away a lot of the brickwork on both this side, this south, and uh, the sister, the sister arches on the main entrance. And I don't know if I was clear on the phone the other day, Karen, so I want to make sure I mention it today. The intent for the roofing material of the main structure is to be a simulated clay tile as well, similar to what St. Paul's did, if you guys are familiar with that project. And I, I forgot about that when we talked on the phone the other day, so I want to make so sure. We were going over all the changes. And then the solar mm -hmm. panel, so I thought they were solar panels, but the skylights Correct. have also been um, taken away. This is, this is actually the first solution. Correct. Oh, you did have it. I did have it. Okay, because I was going to pass it around, but. No, I, I included the. Pretty sure. Yeah. So I can flip back and forth, but I'm going to give it to you, Brenda, to sure. describe um, the changes in more detail. But that's generally um, what has happened. Correct. Correct. So, so as Karen correctly alluded to, we, um, as we were doing our budgeting exercise, we were as as any project you're trying to balance when you get your application in and your budget to make sure that they align so that you don't get something ahead of yourself. And as we uh, we made the submission with the intention of coming uh, last month, however, as we got the budget numbers, we were over budget. And so we had to do a series of things uh, to try to bring it back into budget. There are components of the design that we have that don't affect you on the interior that we've done to, to bring in things back into budget. We've also shifted the building slightly to uh, the south to so that we don't affect as much of the uh, existing uh, notatorium locker room for those of you f familiar with the St. Charles facility. Um, but essentially the, the concepts, concepts of the plan are still the same. Um, Karen, if you wanna just go to page one real quick. Uh, so you will enter the building primarily through the south there um, and that is our main entrance. You'll see on the elevations, that space creates a large space that will be our um, entry vestibule. You will see the colonnade that connects to the other colonnade on the south. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, that colonnade that we have created is now aligned such that it will directly go into the tunnel uh, through St. Charles. And the intent is actually to make that tunnel that is a vehicular experience, a pedestrian experience. We will be incorporating courtyards into the learning resource center project that'll be coming next. Um, but you can, then we have our large space, which is the octagonal space with bleachers for basketball games, volleyball games, events, uh, locker rooms, restrooms, et cetera. Karen, if you want to maybe go to page three, second page is just the, um, uh, the mezzanine level. So you can see here, the colonnade that I was speaking of on the South elevation there comes across to the main entrance of the building. Um, and connects to the existing colonnade. Uh, that, that portion of colonnade, we do intend to have the uh, actual clay tile on, not the simulated clay tile. And in fact, there's a portion that has to be removed of the existing colonnade. So we're gonna try to reuse some of that so we get a better match as well. Uh, but the intent is that for the roof portion above, uh, that it would be the simulated clay tile. Um, there is, we reduced the brick detailing quite a bit and it is hard to see on this, maybe uh, Karen, as you go, the next one will see it, but you can see as you go around, there you go, thank you. As you go around the west side, uh, we have incorporated some of the typical cross brick detailing at the top. Uh, we've included the band that is, uh, that is typical of the school at the mid-level uh, and we will have a guttered roof around the, around the perimeter there as well. If you want to go maybe to some of the more enlarged elevations. 
So you can see uh, something not showing up right there on that one. I'm sorry, go to the next one, Karen. There's something not quite showing. Oh, I know what that is, okay. Um, so that is the main entrance now. So you can see there is the, the uh, triple um, soldier course along with the soldier courses along the side, which takes uh, some language from the existing. What they did on the archway that comes down from the Walter Commons, the existing archway did not have that, that rusticated base. Uh, but as it came down, they added a rusticated base uh, down. So as you come across the archway to our main entrance, we were maintaining that rusticated base. Uh, and then we're ma maintaining kind of the typical dental detail around the top and the cross. And that's the side of it. Now, Karen, if you go back to, I'm sorry, to page four now. So what you're seeing there is through that, that is intended to show through the um, archway, there would be a glass opening on the other side there. Um, and if you go down to the next one, oh, I'm sorry, slide down there. And there you can see that that archways with the rusticated base. So actually the top of the rusticated base is the existing, what we would call zero elevation for the, uh, for the archways that are on the front of the building. And as I mentioned, as it come down the hill from the Walter Commons, they added that rusticated base. So we were, we were matching that as we go across there. And we will be matching all the detail of that existing archways with the, um, the layers of brick as you turn the corner and the, the little ins and outs zigzags as you come zigzags as you come around. And I think that is, and if you go back around there, that would be kind of, that's really just the, um, as you come around to the, the uh, oh, that's just the south entry, that's just the south side of that. So the building, as you go around the perimeter would match uh, on page three, Karen. Um, that elevation on the other elevations as well. Now, as Karen mentioned, uh, the you want to go back to the now go back to the uh, original submission. So you can see on the uh, the main things that have changed there is the cupola has been removed. Uh, the on the lower elevation, Karen. Um, the main entrance has been lowered and the sister arches have been removed. Um, the cupola and the sister arches, uh, a reduced version of what you're seeing here is being bid as an alternate. The intention for the cupola now is to have like a three foot brick cupola uh, without windows. Um, just very similar to if you go to around to the front of the building, there's a, a small brick cupola, cupola on the front of the building. Uh, and then obviously the sister arches because the front entrance has been lowered uh, would be lowered as well. And then, uh, so we're, we're intending to bid the cupola and the uh, sister arches as an alternate. And if we can afford them, we will. Uh, we are also planning on doing the same thing on the skylights, which you can see on the right there uh, on that elevation. Otherwise, as you go around the building, obviously the, the detailing has been greatly reduced um, to, to accommodate the budget. Uh, perhaps it may end up being better because it may end up being offsetting the original building more appropriately rather than trying to mimic it. So that's it in a nutshell. I'd be happy to entertain any questions and get your feedback. Yeah, so we'll ask for uh, board member questions or comments. I'll start with uh, Mr. Hellman. Uh, yeah, I think the, the loss of detailing on the West facades, I think is, um, is sad uh, that that really added a lot to this building uh but i understand your issues uh my other only comment is that for your future phases uh i think uh, it would be helpful uh, it, it certainly helps i think with the public as well uh to to, to have maybe a colored rendering so sure. we can see the materials uh black and white drawings are they can be interpolated a lot of different kinds of ways uh and so for future projects and, and I think that's actually a requirement anyway, uh, but and I'm not sure there is a set, but if there is, it's not in the set that I have here, so. That was more of an ideal when it was initially submitted. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's a rendering, it's in the package, but it's not as- It's not, um, it doesn't represent this design. It's not, it doesn't reflect the current design. Correct, so I think as again, as a matter of course, uh, it, it, it's a little odd to approve architectural drawings uh, when you're dealing just with black and white drawings and you don't know any of the colors. And, and it's tough to read the materials. So next time, let's Absolutely. make sure that's part I guess our, our, our incorrect assumption is be, was because we're matching everything that's kind of existing, it was less of, a, uh, less of an issue, but we'd be happy to do that. Right. 
Is this drawing is the intent? I'm sorry. Is this the drawing that? No. Correct. So that yeah. It shows the material. Yeah. Oh. Well, so I think Kathy was actually referring to the renderings that were included when we did the um, right. master plan submission, right? But those are early designs. Those were yeah. very sketchy. Yeah. I'm just talking about indicating what. Correct. The so this is the intention. The yeah. bricks would match the existing bricks. Uh, the the rusticated base would match the rusticated base. All of the match matching all the other materials uh, for the school along the way, including the uh, as you come around, it has a like a dark bronze uh, window framing, etc. Matching the glass glazing colors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as you work your way around. So I guess that was that was what we were trying to do the first time we submitted. We took a, we had to take a lot of those pictures off because okay. it was also very representative of the detailing that we weren't doing. This time, <laughs> Mr. Scott. <clears throat> um, first, I think um, in the first meeting prior to the monthly table, um, that was a you know very discussed. We had a lot of discussion topics on that, so, and, and it was evident in your submittal last month with the month that you tabled uh, that you one listened very well and. And not just because we, you know, I think you, you really paid attention to the direction and the ideas and the, the connection we were looking for. Uh, and, I, and I really appreciate that. I think the effort there was um, was very well done uh, and actually got very excited about the project. Um, and I thought also your thoroughness in, in using photographs and tying that all together was very well done. So thank you. Um, obviously, um, budgets are a huge effort and I understand that, uh, but I, I would, uh, you know, I need. I was disappointed to open up the, the new one because of those budget constraints. Sure. Um, I do think the overall design does blend well with the, exist, the, the existing structures, and I think the, as long as we're continuing to hold on to the same materials, the bricks, the, the roofs, uh, I think it will blend in well. I'm worried about the large expanse of the blank walls, and I would love to see those um, maybe even minor details or other maybe depending on how the budget comes in on the, as you work through this to see what other little things can be done in the brickwork to kind of at least provide a little bit of a visual interest there. Uh, and I do miss the cupola. <laughs> I think the roof is a, is a very overpowering uh, mass. And, and even if the cupola is not a full, you know, lit, you know, glass windows or something, but some sort of structure or some sort of element there, architectural detail, I think would be important to kind of cap that building because that roof is so immense. I mean, it's, it's going to be visible. Right. So I feel that there needs a little, little bit of detail, but I understand why it's out. <laughs> Those are easily taken out. So overall, I, I appreciate the efforts. I like the site plan uh, and, I, and I appreciate the, the connection to the existing building. So no other comments. Thank you. Ms. Strasser. Uh, this is more of a procedural question. If we go back to some version of a cupola, will we have an opportunity to review that? Because it seems like that would be a pretty uh, significant piece of the design yeah and it's not what was in the original application it's, it's a new design. it's a new version yeah I, i'm uncomfortable bringing this to a vote you know not but there's there's so much stuff in play here tonight is it, you and of course you knew that coming before <laughs> us so is this a design review for you that you will come back uh with uh that completed after the budgets have been finalized and the, the challenge that we have is i'm not sure the budget will be fully finalized in timeline standing. But what we could do, um, we, we, we certainly anticipate that we might have to come back next month. I mean, that's that's, that's the situation. What's that? January. Yeah, we don't meet in December. Uh, Correct? Correct. So, Jim, could you be sworn in, please? Jimmy Negron, Monica Cozing. Yeah, yes, I do. So it would be our intent to get approval and the cupola, if we have to, if we're going to, if we get budget, we'd have to come back in for the cupola. No, no doubt. So if, if, that yeah, so if we, if that we, really yes, that, and the answer to your question is that, so if we have to add the cupola, we'll have to come in. So what the idea was yes. we leave here with approval so we can get, because there's just the market conditions in construction goes far beyond what we all, I mean, we've, I've never experienced the things that we're experiencing now. So the concept of not just getting drawings, locking up subcontractors and locking up the manufacturers is critical. So if we're gonna add the cupola, we'll come back for the cupola, knowing that that, that component would have to potentially be delayed and, but we can get a lot of work done that, that while, we're, our, while we're going through. Right. So just as a point of clarity, I think, I yeah. think that's important. And the other thing is 
from an architectural brick standpoint, you know, the original building is what you saw, which was so beautiful. The brick detailing is consistent with what we did in 2006, and it's better than what we did in 94. So in perspective, not that perspective counts all the time, we're doing what we did in 2006, which was, it did honor the existing building, but it was less then, but it, we're, not, we're, we're not going back to what we did in 94. And I just thought it would be important to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think if I can, if I can extrapolate on what Mr. Negron said, our original intention was not to seek approval for both. That was through conversations that came with staff. Our original intention was to try to get approval of the revised version. But because of conversations with staff, they mentioned that perhaps we should try to get both. But if it's cleaner and it makes everybody more comfortable, and I didn't know there wasn't a December meeting, to be honest. So that kind of threw me off here a second ago. My thought was if, if the option B was exactly like the which it, which it likely will not be. Well, then, then, then yeah. Happens. So I think I would I would like to present this as an application trying to get approval of the new version. And if we are able to find funding for the cupola, the sister arches and things, we will come back at another time as a, as a revision to the application. OK, well, let's continue with the comments and then we'll have Thank you. So my only other observation is that I know it's hard to forget the cupola and the other details uh, because it was submitted <laughs> there, right? Uh, so I'm trying to just focus on what we have in front of us and forget that um, because without forgetting it, it's it, you know it's hard to be judgmental of the new design. Um, so I think that's that was my only comment. I, I'm trying to. Put that front and center. Let's focus on this design. Forget about the old one. And, and see how it works. Um, my other question is this may be off the wall, but was there any consideration for solar on this new solar panels? Uh, we have not discussed that, and I wouldn't imagine that we have the budget for it, right? Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Krosky? Okay. So, uh, since I wasn't really a part of the previous design, that helps you out <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in terms of September sure. as an up here reviewing. Um, I guess I would say um, uh, if there are, if you find through the budgetary process um, some additional funds, because it is stripped back quite a bit, um, I would say the base, the fact that you have, you know, a base um, down there, uh, potentially carrying that around on the other uh, elevations would help tie the, the rusticated a base. Better. Yeah, that rusticated base is nice. Another option is okay, maybe you can't do uh, the rusticated. Perhaps, you know, it's uh, banding with the brick, right? So perhaps think of some other less costly ways to mimic some of the things going on. Um, you know, I don't know enough about the building to know what is like the original building versus the 94 versus the other. Uh, was it 96 or, or 2000 something? Five. Yeah, there we go. Um, but, you know, in looking at the pictures, because we did have access to the previous set, you know, there are some other details that probably could be explored. Some of the band, uh, some of the vertical banding, uh, what I call the dots of brick, mm -hmm. which were a little bit darker, um, you know, that can help play, you know, you can look at that for maybe some of the, what is that, West? But the west elevations. Yeah, the so, west elevation is the one that is the yeah. other main elevation. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there are some of those. Some of those, and I even think that elevation shows some banding down at the base. I'm not positive, but I feel like I see it there. Um, so just some things to consider. Those are not as, you know, probably expensive as like a rusticated base. Sure. Um, and then I don't have any issues with the, the rest of what you did with um, the entry. I think that's still very nice. I think the colonnade is very nice. Um, and I like that you kept it, kept uh, detailing up around the top of it, so. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, one more question or, or comment. Um, the, the West facade, there are a lot of changes from the previous one, which I think we all really liked and felt really comfortable with sure. because it did a lot and the details matter and a lot of those details are now gone. Um, so on the Western facade, I think one of two things or both, 
uh, is to work with staff to figure out the, the, the most westerly of the three panels. What can be done on that panel to put some detail back? And or uh, obviously landscaping uh, in the area there so that to, to soften that wall, because that, that wall is going to be the largely public side of this thing. People are gonna drive by that. And it's just a real large expanse, unbroken. Uh, and and uh, the dissonance of going from what we saw before with the detailing, which helped resolve those masks and to, and to give it some life. In fact, they, they framed the details. Sure. And now to say they're all gone, that's a big change. Sure. So uh, I think you know, we understand budgets. We understand that we all have budgets. Uh, but at the same token, um, where we take things and what we put back uh, are going to matter on this project. Sure. So I, I would uh, I would almost make that as part of the condition. I'm sorry, what was the, what would you say is the condition? Uh, one of two things, or, or both, uh, that we look to providing, work with staff, provide some detail on that Western panel, uh, and there'd be landscaping installed to soften that particular wall uh, as it against the, uh, against the, um, uh, between that and the drive. But, the, the, but that it would be remanded to the design consultant. Correct. And that would be a condition. Correct. Okay. If I can speak to that, we do have intentions to include landscaping there, so that we can we can certainly okay certainly include that part. I, the detail is still up in the air. An additional condition, of course, is obviously that, that there be a phase one site plan that shows what site construction will take place as part of this project, uh, and what section that is, subset that is of the master plan that we're looking at. Got it. So that's just clarity with what phase one is. Yep, that's in the works. So that's okay. Uh, so I would say that uh, I understand budgets. I understand the constraints that we have these days, and I understand the, the importance or the the uh, intent to get moving. However, the ARB is here to review something that is going to be there for a long time. And we look back in 30 years and, you know, the rushing through is either going to be evident or it's going to not be evident because you really worked out the details. So I'm uncomfortable with this elevation in particular. I'm also uncomfortable with the lack of the, not necessarily a cupola, but more like a crown, something at the top. There are lots of examples in architectural history of this. It doesn't even have to be something that interferes with the roof structure in any way. It's something that is simply uh, a cap or a crown. There's, there's some churches in Rome that are octagonal that have that. It can be done in stucco. It can be done in you know, terracotta. It can be done in metal. Um, we worked on a project in a chapel in Fort Wayne where the whole cupola was metal, but we divided the panel so that it looked like it was a traditional you know, layout um, and it was inexpensive. So. That being said, you know, there's, I think there's things that you could look at in your budget that could help bring something back. That roof, the amount of tile that's on that roof is overwhelming. The amount of brick on the facades is overwhelming. For, it's a massive building. It's very monumental and it needs some uh, additions, I think. Now, can this be phased? Could you say that, you know, we have a phase one and we're gonna do this and we have a phase two for the building. I understand master plans always have phases. Why can't the building have a couple phases? Um, and maybe people will get excited, you know, during the building and if they can see images of the crown and, you know, phase two for some other brickwork or like some kind of panels that could be inserted later, then maybe they would say, well, why aren't we doing that? And they, they fund it in time, okay? But I, I would want to see that design. So if the, if the idea is that you, you do not want to table this tonight and you're looking to go for an up or down vote, um, I'm uncomfortable. I can bring it to a vote, but I'm uncomfortable, you know, with what I'm seeing here tonight as a final design for forever for the Convocation Center. The, the challenge uh, we face is, and shame on me, I didn't realize there wasn't a December meeting. Um, we losing all the way to January, losing two months, in our process is crippling. Could, uh, yeah. could we do a special meeting? Yeah, we could. We could. We could make it a condition. You would have an approval. Have an approval. Condition. Okay, that would be that would be amazingly helpful. Yeah, so we have approval with conditions to come back on these specific details. Right. Now, 
like I like I would say, and this is completely up to you and your client, but if the budget constrains you in such a way that those other elements could not be added at this time, can it be something that would be, you know, phased, you know, for the future? Um, this happens all the time on churches, yep. Yep. as Mr. Negron knows, and everybody. So, you know, but we would want to see that design. We would want to see, Absolutely. the ARB would want to know that the final design of this building included, you know, these elements. I 100% understand. I mean, I sit on the German Village Commission and I would have the same opinion. <laughs> and they do the same kind of things. Yeah. Right. Mr. Chairman, wanted, I mean, just a thought out of the, uh, the other thing that would be interesting, and I don't know how the rest of the board would feel about this, uh, that, there, that there'd be a large cross at the top of that roof. It kind of reads for that. I mean, there's, there's something that just provides some finish, some level, and is and obviously is then representative of what you're all about anyway. Yeah, we, we discussed that, uh, and there was a lot of discussion about the cross and the appropriateness of it. Um, our concern was we didn't want to take away from the cross on the main the main building uh, and the importance of it. Uh, and obviously every time you install a cross, as Mr. Heyer knows on a Catholic facility, it's a very important decision. And I know uh, I'm on the board for the Mount Carmel College of Nursing. When they removed the cross from the top of that building, the bishop had to approve removal of that cross and, and how they did that. So um, that being said, some kind of crown, whether it's a cross or whether it's something that's more appropriate for the use of the building, um, we've we've talked about how what's fun about the quad is that you have almost uh, towards the grotto you have a spiritual component towards the north you have a physical component towards the right you have a, a academic component and towards the south you have a um, arts component and so something perhaps more appropriate on the crown uh, we would we would certainly consider if you were to have a phase two on this building would you be able to in this phase for instance block out the framing for, for the cupola. future windows. Oh, I see. Uh, for future, you know, a special brick projections that might be on these blank facades. I mean, these are these are things that is part of the design process. I think you know, because it's a long term project, right? You're going to build this. You're going to want it up, but in terms of its embellishment and the fact that it's going to be with us for hundreds of years, Absolutely. you know, we would want to see. What, how that's all included, even though it's not all built at once. And is, is that feasible? Is that something that we can expect from your team, you know, for, for, the, for the conditions? Mr. Negron or Mr. Valentis to, to, to chime in. So um, I'm just trying to, thank you, Bill. I understand what, um, what you're asking for. The cupola, I think, is the easy, not easy enough, or whatever, whatever goes on the roof is an easy enough um, component, even framing out windows would be i just don't know how you would detail the brick so that you can come back and do it later on right so my that mm -hmm. that's the the thought in my head is how the heck you would do that's kind of i've never had an architect ask me that um, <laughs> we, we 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 always work with the the brick dimensions so. <laughs> <laughs> so we could um i guess we could put panels in that would be removed and re, right. then relayed up we right. could contemplate you know brick expansions where yes. that would come down and then yeah. you would be able to add detailing later yeah, on later on right we could do that right um and that's just in the brick detailing then and we could work through with staff on that right yeah. yeah so i guess trying to consume what you said right the concept of if we were able to work through with staff and say okay this is what a future condition would potentially look like and then how we would detail the brick so that we would have expansion so we'd basically be pulling out those panels and relaying those and windows could be framed in the structure yeah. now yeah. that can be done and then in the cupola as you as we all all the architects and builders know we could easily make sure that 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 condition could be added so the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> we talked ourselves through it. I needed, I needed, I needed to think. Well, just you don't want to spend money twice, right? You got to be careful. You right. Want to be, right. Exactly. Right. Right. We have a fiduciary you don't, responsibility. You don't want these giant lifts out there putting this cupola on. You know. Yeah. Well, three years from now, yeah. when. Well, we replace cupolas on re yeah. religious structures all the time. So yeah, but, the concept of that is, you know, but making sure that it's ready, I think, is important. So I'm, I'm comfortable with what we just said there. So as a condition. The, the condition in this case would be that the design of a crown or cupola on the building, as well as the clarification of the blockouts for potential future niches, uh, brick details on the facades would be 
uh, presented to the ARB, correct? Yes. After review by uh, city staff. That sounds great. Subject to final design review by the ARB. Yeah, subject to final design review by the ARB. In the meantime, you can get started and. And then down the road, when you're ready to take out the panels and put in design, that could be through staff or. Or through uh, ARB. Right. We, I think we would like to see it because this is such a prominent building. Uh, that's, and, that's actually very helpful for us. At least you have your approval to start ordering yeah. materials and getting contracted. No, that's, that yeah. sounds like a great resolution. And I think the public, you know, when they see this go up and they're going to wonder why the big blank walls and why the big area of tile roof with no detail, you know, everybody can explain that this is a phased project if, if there Absolutely. are questions like that to come up. And, and there are many components of St. Charles Chairman Hire, as you know, that are named after people. So those are all sponsor opportunities. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like that pitch. <laughs> Is there anyone in the audience that has standing that would like to speak on this on this project? Seeing none. Um, Ms. Rose, can we have the findings of fact and decisions of the board? Findings of fact and decisions of the board for application number ARB-21-51 for property located at 2010 East Broad Street. For the proposed improvement, which is a convocation center and renovation of a lobby area, the board finds that a certificate of appropriateness should be approved for the proposed structure and modifications which are architecturally compatible with the existing structures with the following conditions. A, clay is included as a roof, roofing material. B, work with staff to add more brick detailing to the west facade. C, include a site plan with the plan, final plan. And D, a phased approval be granted for final design ideas of a crown slash cupola, clarification of block out or improvements, which would be subject to final design review by the architecture review. And E, the landscape plan for the west edge of the property. Do you say that? I didn't hear it. Like I said, site plan, should I say site plan, which includes landscaping? Yeah, for the western edge that's been approved for the front, um, but not the western edge. If I may, Kathy, I believe you read clay tile roof, and what we mentioned was we wanted to do the simulated clay tile. Thank you. Yes, clay simulated tile. clay tile. Simulated. Simulated. Yep. Simulated. Thank you. Any other corrections or comments to the facts? Do I have a motion? So move. Second. In. Please call the roll. Ms. Krosky. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Strasser? Yes. Chairman Hire. With the conditions that have been granted and approved, yes. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your help. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks for good working that out. Our next order of old business application number ARB 2158. The address is 221 Ashbourne. The applicant is Carrick Sherrill. The owners are Alex Marsh and Katie Walker Marsh. The applicant is requesting architectural review and approval of a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition of an existing fire damaged home and the construction of a new single family home. The applicant could come forward. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mike Shannon on behalf of the applicant. Could you be sworn in please? Yes. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth. I do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bocor, do you have comments? Yes, I do. This um, applicant is uh, requesting to review and approval on a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition of an existing fire damaged home. This applicant was tabled at the August, September, and October ARB meetings. Um, in the staff report, and I can go through them, but I think it'd probably be better. Um, during the design discussion, uh, there was a list of uh, requested information, things like clarification of the eave heights, of the ridge heights, um, development of details, gutters, downspouts, deep lintel, soft at rake details, reconsideration of placement of the band board. Um, I've 
uh, quite a few lists. Almost, almost everything in there has been addressed with the exception of a few things. Um, and we can go through those, I think, when the architect comes up speaking about the design. Um, we had extensive conversation, and I believe that um, we have discussed the demolition uh, pretty thoroughly. Not that that can't be discussed again, but we had gotten to the point where we have really concentrated on the design of the replacement of the home and making it in keeping with the scale of the neighborhood and the streetscape um, better, bringing the eave and the ridge line to better match the neighboring properties and the floor plates to better match the um, neighboring properties as well. Um, all of the, I don't want to go through them in detail again, but all of the criteria for demolition we've gone through and are included in the packet and have been online for those of you who um, would like to follow along or didn't get a chance to look through those. There's preservation um, criteria addressed by um, Joe Berardi. We went through um, the fire damage from an engineering, structural engineer's report. So I, I'm not going to rehash all of that. There's also some streetscapes that I've put together through photo montages in the staff report that I can bring up as well to kind of show the ridge heights relative to the rest of the streetscape and the details um, that the original design didn't really seem to go with the neighboring properties, but I think we're getting there. It's, um, it's much more in scale and massing. Um, just in conclusion of my staff comments, the applicant has addressed some of the board's concerns, um, but not all. One of the things that I'm most concerned about is the lowering, and perhaps when the architect comes up, he can talk to this. So we've talked about lowering the floor plate, um, at least one, one step, I think it was one step or two steps down, two steps down to make the grade level equal to what it is now. And I didn't see that in the drawings. Um, other than admittedly, I got the drawings fairly late, so I didn't have a chance to do a really thorough review um, before this meeting. If the board chooses to move to a vote to this tonight, I would um, uh, suggest that the final material samples and colors, and I believe they might have brought them with them, um, be submitted for staff review and for board review. A height measurement at grade floor plates and ridge line be provided and marked on site and approved by staff. That the landscape plan be reviewed and approved by the Bexley Tree and Public Gardens Commission um, or the city's landscape consultants, whichever the board um, prefers. Commission. It's got to go through the commission. I'm sorry. It has to go through the by code. Uh, a preservation plan for existing trees be submitted. I didn't see that in there, but you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Uh, it's part of our ordinance that there needs to be a survey of what's exactly there before, not just the maintenance we can. I'm, I'm comfortable with the condition of that, but that's for tree preservation, et cetera. Um, final design to be reviewed and approved by the city's design consultant and all minor changes to the design subject to approval by residential design consultants. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Shannon. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, happy Veterans Day. Um, to you. Just occurred to me that if I make it till January, I will be a veteran of 40 years of the practice of law. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, uh, I wish I had learned uh, a long time ago um, something that I call uh, the juncture we're at tonight. And that's what I call the epiphany or, or the rule of inverse proportionality. Uh, we are at the stage in this process where uh, my clients' chances are su of success are inversely proportional to how much time I speak this evening. Uh, I think that um, not to be dismissive of the demolition issue, but I think there's been sufficient testimony and uh, be willing to rehash that subsequent to uh, Carrick's presentation, uh, but with respects to the demolition, um, for lack of a better term, I, I don't want to be at a dead house. Um, I think staff has been uh, um, extremely professional to work with. Um, I like the bullet points in a staff report that allows the applicant to try to respond to them. It doesn't include everything that was maybe said at the meeting, but it serves as a great frame of reference. Uh, to the extent the discussions are going to center on uh, the new design um, from our perspective, and then we can certainly address any questions the board has 
about demolition in addition to that, I'd like Carrick to come up and, and walk through um, uh, the new rendering and address staff's comments uh, one by one. And thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. you be sworn in, please. Please state your name. Carrick Cheryl. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth? I certainly do. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, we've made some uh, adjustments to the design of the building um, in response to uh, your comments from last month. Uh, primarily on the on the front facade, we've uh, changed up the proportions a little bit of the, uh, the windows um, to provide some additional emphasis to the first floor. Um, as discussed, uh, we've removed um, some of the the band board detailing uh, that was. Um, spoken about unfavorably at the last meeting. Um, we've added a uh, major, the a group, uh, most of the information that you asked for with regard to Eve Heights and Ridge Heights is on the drawing. Um, I'm gonna respond briefly to um, the comments about the, um, the relationship of grade to the first floor. Um, it's noted there um, in the elevation as well as the detail on sheet A25 um, that's uh, 20 inches from grade to first floor um, with a 14 inch um, uh, floor member and a sill plate that doesn't provide uh, too much room between um, the grade and the beginning of wood construction. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure uh, that it's good practice to lower the building much further into the ground. Um, um, with regard to that, um, I, there's been some discussion about the, the comparison um, of our design to the building behind us um, that is a new construction building. Um, and we're only providing that as a reference because it's on an adjacent parcel, not because um, we're comparing it as a new construction, a new construction. So um, with that, I um, will take your comments. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Drosser, if you would start the comments from the board, please. Uh, I, Kevin Trouble is the architect for a better understanding of the relationship of the height of this building to the neighbor buildings. Uh, maybe I'm not hearing that in your head. It's down here. Which document? Yeah. Oh, A01. She A01. Well, I, I would observe that um, and I think continue feedback from the architects on the panel tonight is probably still in order. And I'm going to defer to them because at this point, we're past the uh, I think we'll focus on design. So I'm going to defer to them. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Krosky. Mm, sure. Um, and you were new to this, right? Because you well, were yeah, a little bit. I mean, I I sat in in the audience, um, so I've seen past versions. Right. Yeah. Um, so some of the things uh, that I like uh, seeing uh, on the site plan, uh, I think it's great that you're preserving the old growth trees, uh, especially in the front. Uh, I'm assuming that one in the back is similar. Is that an old growth? I'm a little concerned about whether or not it will be able to be preserved. So um, I think it's just, it's something that has to be reviewed with um, the specialists in the city. Uh, I hope it can be. Um, the, with regards to the elevation, so the front elevation, I think it's way better that you took the band out. Um, I think the front elevation looks much better. Um, something I, I was looking at the details uh, because you provided them. <laughs> so 
sometimes we don't get to see these. Um, I guess I would ask why um, you are proposing uh, wood sills and aprons over, I mean, you're using brick, you already have some brick row locks, you know, why are you not proposing using brick for the sills uh, versus wood? I, I, I would just be concerned about maintenance, longevity. Um, I'm, I don't know if you're, it says wood sill. I don't know if you're using like real wood or if you're using a, you know, modified product of some sort. So I, I'd like you to speak to that a little bit. Um, I, I understand the concern about wood. Um, I was doing what I could to um, pay some respect to the existing building that has uh, wood sills on the front um, uh, and, and um, pay some homage to, to what we're um, removing um, with the wood sills. Um, you know, if through um, further investigation of the available products, um, you know, we choose to go with uh, um, a composite product that would that would emulate wood for those sills in order to increase the longevity of it uh, without continued maintenance. I think that's something that uh, could be discussed with staff um, as a as an equal alternative. But for now, I would say it's wood. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's okay. Um, I think that's probably, yeah, one of my, probably a, a larger concern for me, just, to, you know, as an old, as a homeowner, I know it's going to be a new building um, and the old ones, you know, potentially being taken down. Uh, and if it was me, you know, I would want the longevity. Um, so, I, you know, there would probably be less maintenance than if you're having to paint wood sills everywhere. Right. right? Um, so that's just a consideration to think about and to work with potentially with the design consultant. Am I right? Um, and I think that's it. I think that's all I want to. Uh, oh, um, and we, I, oh no, you did talk about that. So never mind. I'm good. Thank you. That's it. There's one other thing that I forgot to mention. Like, I'm, I'm struggling with the asphalt tables, what we have now, what we're losing. That's a big loss. Um, so that's something that we'll, we'll see what the other board members think about that. But um, but we're doing a demo. Yeah, with the building with David Slate, right, or Clay, and then losing that. That's Clay Tile. That's that's going to be a it's going to be a tough sell for me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scott. We're still just to make sure I'm clear. We're still looking at the demolition and the design. Yes, so that is correct. We have not voted on either, so they're both up for discussion. So, under the uh, City of Bex's code codified ordinance for demolition and removal of existing structures, uh, there is a process. I'm sure we're all fairly aware of the document. Uh, under Section C, the process for review of the Architectural Review Board. The first statement, number one, is that the structure to be to be demolished or removed is not historically or architecturally significant. Um, it is my position that the exterior of the building uh, is architecturally significant uh, and worthy of preservation. Under the ordinance, uh, there are other factors uh, which I will go through. Um, if the historic or architecturally significant and worthy of preservation, that denial of certificate of appropriateness would cause a, a or one, a substantial economic, economic hardship or two, that the demolition is justified by the existence of unusual or compelling circumstances. Um, in the ordinance that takes us to um, section E, the criteria for determining substantial economic hardship. Knowing what uh, has caused, uh, what, what the interior condition of the, uh, the building is, obviously through the reports um, and the damage that is, is taking place, um, we need to, I need to go through each one of these and see and evaluate that and, and then give you my position. Uh, number one, under E, Section E is denial of the certificate will result in a substantial reduction in economic value of the property. Um, this is a complicated topic, but since the, the damage is already done, the economic damage, is, I, in my eyes, is already done, uh, and the property value is, should be represented of that. Um, so that, that doesn't necessarily qualify. E2, for me, denial of the certificate will result in a substantial economic burden 
because of the structure cannot be maintained in its current form at a reasonable cost. Uh, I believe that this is something that uh, actually does apply to this application because of the, of the interior conditions. It is non-habitable. There's no one's living there. So that is an impact and an economic burden because um, the structure can't, it could be maintained, but there's maintained for what? Non-occupied use. And then E3, denial of the certificate will result in a substantial economic burden because the cost of preser preserving or restoring the structure will impose an unreasonable and financial burden. This is the clear definition for me of what is really related to the demolition of this property or not. And I am unable to get past E3 uh, because I believe that there is a substantial financial difficulty to restore the interior electric, um, install of HVAC, um, and bring back the interior to a reasonable, livable conditions. E, uh, section E uh, continues with the criteria determining unusual and compelling circumstances. I won't go through each of these because some of these do apply, some of these do not. But again, with the interior damage and the fire, uh, I, I, I lean towards that there is also unusual and compelling circumstances for this property. And I'm, I'm, as much as I, it pains me, I, I really do like the exterior of this, prop, this building. I like how it sits on its property. Uh, I, I will not be able to deny a demolition based on these ordinances that is set by Exley. So uh, I will be, have to be, in, just to let you know, I'll be happy to be, I will have to be in favor of that demolition. That being said, uh, part of that is uh, related to some of the, part of that ordinance is of course the revision or the design and the building that's coming, being proposed. Uh, you have worked hard at, at updating that design and, and working with us on that, and I appreciate that. Um, I think the, the latest elevation, uh, I think, is, is much better. I was looking at the rendering a little bit earlier, and I, was, I realized that it wasn't the latest design because I was questioning some of the moves that you had already made, but they were the ones that we had discussed last time. So uh, this particular design, that is, that is out of date uh, because I would not be able to support that. But I think you are, uh, have come very far, especially on the... The front, I think, is 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 a, is a it's a pr approaching where it needs to be, and I think I really like how you continue to develop the sides and the rear of the house. So I don't have any uh, specific critical feedback for you tonight, but I think you are definitely moving in the right direction. And, and for me, now that I'm past the, the demo decision, um, I think you know, I would I would be continued support while you uh, for this particular replacement with working with uh, staff, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hellman? Uh, yes, um, clearly on this case and the case to follow, uh, we spent a lot of time and uh, I, I know all of us individually have gone through our own processes of dealing with this and likewise uh, um, reviewing the code and going through all. Um, and so I think at the end of the equation, we all have to come to our own individual understandings of our decisions and why we make the decisions we make. Um, and I think at, uh, at first blush, I think my opinion of the way the code is structured, uh, the way that the, um, the purpose section is written, I won't go through that, I read that into the minutes before, uh, I think demolition needs to be a high bar to, to get over. Uh, and for all of the right reasons in terms of um, the character of the, the, the community, uh, the retention of, of buildings, historic fabric, and go on and on and on with that. Um, but at the same time, there needs to be, quote, responsible renewal and redevelopment. Um, and so I've gone over that in my head over and over and over uh, many times. And uh, so I'm in a position where Mr. Scott is. Uh, in going through a, a, a turning point for me, there were two turning points. One is architecture, I'll get to that, the, but, the, but the first regarding demolition um, was looking inside the house, looking through the windows, finding out that there's nothing inside the house. And, and a, house, a house's value, if you go through the components of building, uh, the, the, all of the building pieces, uh, the things that are missing on this house constitute about 44% of the value of a house. Um, that, if, if, that, in my, if that is not a unique and compelling situation, then I'm not sure there are any. Uh, so uh, I do think in the nature of, uh, 
uh, we've 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 certainly batted around terms like uh, architecturally significant, historically significant, and so forth and so forth. Tried to put some meaning to that, and I believe architectural being architecturally significant is a continuum. Some houses are more architecturally significant than others. Some are insignificant, and we may talk about that uh, uh, as the evening uh, uh, ensues. I do not think this house is architecturally insignificant. That said, I don't think it's that high on the scale of significance, uh, but I will not demean the existing house that's there. Uh, so in my mind, uh, what has happened to the inside of this house um, is a major problem. And, uh, and, and now I then move to the architecture and uh, the progression of this application from when it first came in um, with a house that I would say maybe it didn't quite fit in quite a, in a few ways, let's say, um, to where we are now is very commendable. Uh, I, my own uh, impression of this house is one of balance and cohesion. Um, the center of the house uh, is the dominant piece. It's, it, and then it, it steps down on both ends. Uh, and then the porch on one side and the garage on the other uh, are antecedent pieces. So I think the, the vocabulary of that works really well. Then the porch brings the center piece of the house out further, uh, gives a little monumentality, but not an, an overt amount of amount. And so in my mind, this is a, uh, a very harmonious design uh, that we've gotten to step by step, but nevertheless, I believe that uh, that we are here. Those are my comments. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that has standing that would like to speak on this project? Please come forward. Um, thanks. Say your name and your address, uh, please. Jamie Rupp, 180 Ashbourne. I'm two houses down from this build on the opposite side of the street. Please be sworn in. Raise your right hand. It's only sore from the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth. Yes. Thank you. And thank you. Please go ahead. I feel like there are several things that are kind of unclear about what's going on here. First off, I almost feel like I walk in here and we're about ready to approve this for demo. Um, and like there's been back channel conversations that have happened. I hope not. Um, I thought that once we left the meeting last time around, this was dead in the water. So when it was already up for to come for, before, to the board in November again, I was a little bit stunned that we we're kind of talking about the same thing, a home that still had an asphalt roof. And last time the criteria was pretty much come to the table with something that's natural material that's consistent with the rest of the street. I mean, I made the point last time that 88% of the street is either tile or slate. There's only three homes on the entire street, they're asphalt. This is a significant roof line that they're presenting in this house. It has a lot of roof. The home is also a scale that's outside of anything else that sits on a third of an acre on our street. Everything else that's a third of an acre is probably about, I mean, 3,200 square feet for the existing home, our home, which is 34. Um, anyway, roughly that scale is what exists on that type of set size lot on the street. This home is closer to the Bowman house, which is maybe another seven homes down the street on the same side that sits on a double lot that's 6,400 square feet. I've never heard a square footage figure thrown out this house, but I'm guessing it's gonna be close to 6,000 once you include the third floor and build out a bathroom there. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious also, who owns this property? Is this contingent upon the demo that they actually seal the deal? Because this house has never been up for, up for sale on, as far as I'm aware. Um, this is more or less an inside deal. Is that a um, question for the staff? I'm throwing it out there because there's, been not, there's not been much transparency about last time. Last time I, I felt like there was po possibly perjury being committed in the fact that the, 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 the proposal was coming forward and saying that he owned the place and then his lawyer comes up and said, well, that's not really true. I've got the owners listed on the application as Alex Marsh and Katie Walker Marsh. Okay. Is there a deed that actually went for, did it actually, was there a closure on this? I mean, have, have we seen what the, what the sale price is? Usually there's a closure on that. And when was the closure on the property? I do not have that information. That would be relevant for this board unless it was correct. No, but it's public information. Right. It's a Franklin County auditor issue. As far as I know, and I, it's- It's I, not an issue for this board. Okay. Well, well, okay, we'll move away from that. But the fact is that we don't know what type of square footage we're even talking about here for this third of a lot. And there's also easement issues that I think are possibly, that are also possibly at stake here, the way this thing sits on the lot relative to the street. 
and the adjacent homes. The square footage, it meets code as far as lot coverage, square footage based on the R. The footprint. Yes. So otherwise it would be going to the Board of Zoning and Planning. Okay. So well, then we're talking about scale, you know, height, width, breadth, depth. Um, but you're right. Um, but the material, the material is the big issue that I have. I mean, when you, when I saw what was being presented, I was kind of like, I'm not sure what that was, but um, it, it doesn't look like the rest of the, the stock on the street. And so that's my big concern. Thank you. Um, yeah, Carrick, if you wouldn't mind coming back forward. I uh, took a look at through these drawings and you know, I'm very uh, encouraged, you know, at the, the direction that the, the design is going. Um, there are a number of things that um, I'd like to comment on in terms of the design. The first is, um, it is actually quite common that a house with a brick veneer has the sill plate behind that brick veneer and the wood uh, joists for the first floor being at greater or lower because there is a solid grouting that happens in that cavity and the waterproofing actually extends and, and protects that band board and the, the sill plate and the, the joist. So it's quite common. We, our, our firm does a number of projects uh, like this. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, having the veneers and then the, the framing behind being protected. Um, you'll find throughout Bexley and New Albany and Upper Arlington that this is quite common. So I wouldn't say that it's bad practice to provide a sill plate and floor joists that actually extend below the, the grade when you have a brick veneer like this. And therefore, you know, one of the things that we asked was that this house be two steps up. And that was, I thought, agreed upon at the last meeting. And so I'm asking that that happen. I think it's important that that happen. If you do that, then my concerns about the eve really go away because you're there. Um, now, I have other issues with, with the eaves, but I think if you lower and make this the two steps, then my concerns about the eaves in terms of their height are, are taken care of. You, can, you've lowered that. Can you clarify the actual dimension of what you mean as two steps? Is that 16 inches from grade to plate or grade to first floor? Well, the steps by code can't be more than seven inches. So you're, whatever you're seven inches off of grade plus seven inches to the first floor, finish floor, then you work your way down. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that would meet code. Um, but that's what your other neighbors have. You know, I, I'm not saying that I measured all these other houses in terms of their heights, but it's consistently two steps, pretty consistent. And um, you just need to meet code in terms of the height. I, I'm not saying that some of the other ones don't, but... That's an important aspect for me. Um, it brings your eaves down into, you know, what I think is what we had asked for before because your neighbor's yeah, eaves are 19.6, which is two houses north and 18 feet, which is the house to the north, directly to the north. So you're well, with, you're within range. You know, right now uh, you're, you're, you're there or, uh, almost, but it's the number of steps and the primary block of the house, it's eave being so high. The ridge height I'm not as concerned with, it's really that eave height, which is what you see from the street and what brings you into relationship with the other houses. And this is something, you know, as we've said here on this board many times, uh, we've, we've, we've been, uh, we've gone through some pain, you know, and anguish over this on other houses. And so we're, we're being firm about these things so that you continue to keep the context of the neighborhood and the, the quality of the architecture. Because for me, as I stated in the last, Meaning, if you're going to replace this house, which has, to me, a lot of character, you have to provide us with a design that is equal or better. And that gets down to the details. And those details are essential, not just for the aesthetics of the house, but also for the longevity. And so that brings into question these wood sills, which even if the second floor of the existing house has these strange wood sills with aprons, it is not, you know, in today's construction, it would it's not going to be done to that same kind of quality, whatever you want. And nobody does wood sills on the outside of brick houses. If you go to the first floor, you, you have row lock, you have a row lock sill. And I would 
strongly encourage you to maintain those row locks because the brick veneer needs to be a solid, it needs to be solid masonry. Unless you're using teak, you know, or some kind of material like that, that and even sealing that against the brick, wood's gonna shrink. So this is a this is a maintenance issue, and it's about preserving the integrity and the value of the houses in this neighborhood. Okay. The details are to me critical at this point in order to feel that uh, you know we've met this condition in the demo that even if the house has, even if the existing house has architectural merit and it's significant in the board's mind, whatever testimony other, you know, not, notwithstanding other testimony from uh, people who have uh, standing, then we can say that the existing structure is architecturally significant or we could in the final vote, but we could say that the replacement was of superior quality or e equal or superior quality to what's there. That's where I'm trying to get you because that's my argumentation. Um, and so if we're gonna get there, we need to go through these steps. And I'm sorry that, you know, it may seem like it's, you know, getting into a lot of details that you as an architect are competent professional on, but for the public record, we need to make sure that it's all said um, so that the public understands that the architecture review board went to great lengths to provide the provide the city of Bexley with something that's equal or greater than what's there. Sure. So, I, under, I understand that okay. and appreciate it. And I've, you know, I, I apologize that it's um, taken as much as it has for you guys to, to carry me along my, um, you know, maybe um, lack of experience with this particular board um, and the uh, the level of detail that's required for to cross these hurdles is um, I've learned a lot. Thank you. You're, you're not dealing with Nantucket here. Okay. This, this board is, you know, try to do a house on Nantucket. Let me tell you. Um, so I'd like to just go on with a, a few more details if you don't mind. Um, so the wood sills, I, I think, need to go because just for the value of the property and the long-term maintenance of, of this house. Um, the second is um, that is yeah. a condition. Is it again? Wood sills. Wood sills. Exterior wood sills. Yeah. And and you know, from my point of view, these are things that are not that cannot be remanded to the design consultant. These are things that this board needs to see. And we're going to have to see this again in my in my estimation. Now you can go for an up or down vote, but in my estimation, this house has to be seen again in order that we do public justice for the design of this house. So the other issues are um, again the floor plate coming down, the wood sills going away. The other thing is these eaves. If you go back to the three D view of this house, we have a real problem here with the long-term maintenance and longevity of your eave system, where you've got a crown at your main block of the house that just turns and dies into the roof. That is a very difficult detail to flash, okay? And you're gonna have all kinds of deterioration there almost immediately. So either you bring all the eaves in line with each other, which I think would be outstanding. It would, it would have a similar quality to what the existing house has in that regard. And you just make you make the roof one roof, and maybe maybe you uh, expand the dormers. You'll save your client money by doing that. Um, you're going to uh, well, you'd have two different. They would be offset still, but having those eaves aligned is going to be a better detail for long term maintenance, and it's going to look better. Um, when you turn the corners on the gables of the house, you have the same issue. You're turning it and dying it into the roof of that side addition. And that is going to be another area of instant deterioration and devaluation of the house. And so what you need to do is do a return eave, okay, that extends about a foot or a foot and a half, and that's it. And there's lots of examples of colonial architecture where it just returns and, and ends on itself, you know, and then you just take the material from there straight up into the eave, which would be my preference is to see the brick go all the way up in the in the gables like the existing house. What I'm trying to do is help you to all to take on some of the characteristic of the existing house, even though you want to do something that's colonial contemporary. I understand that. But some of those just knowing and making it for the public record that you are 
paying deference, you're, you're paying tribute in some way to the existing house, will go a long way for this board and for the neighborhood, I think. Um, the other thing is, is the columns, the piers. So if we're going to do something equal or better than the detailing that we see on the existing house, we can't have wood piers that just have block capitals. We need to do something that's unique. And as, an, as a designer, I would ask that you consider doing something that has more style and a little more you know, detail than the blocks that you see on the, on the, uh, it's on the back porch of the house. The front, I think, is looking very nice in terms of the porch. But these, so those columns, these piers. This house deserves better than just block caps and, and bases. Um, Bexley houses, as you know, pride themselves on their detail, and this detail is happening in Bexley all over the place. So what you're doing by putting them on here is you're taking this design on Ashbourne down to the level of some of these quick additions that get put up in Bexley. And, and I think you can do better than that for the sake of this house. The bases, the, the pedestals, or I'm sorry, the, the capitals. And then there's just a whole arrangement of things of these crowns that don't make sense to me that I think are going to devalue the house if you don't fix them now. One of them is, that this crown condition here seems to be projected out past the edge of the roof. And so where's all that water going? Is it going into a gutter that's right there? Because as you know, code requires you, or most building codes require you to have the roof line extend beyond so that ice can slide off a roof and not destroy the gutter. So this would not allow for that. Okay, you, you get any ice buildup on any of these roofs and they're gonna slide down and break your gutter. Just long-term maintenance, Value, value of the property. Um, so if you go to the detail sheets, you'll see these details that I think need to be worked out. And if you go to the, the second or the last design sheet, we have a crown detail that, and I appreciate that you wanna do something that's kind of contemporary for the Eve condition, but I think you're, you're not putting enough design into this detail just having a, a beveled line instead of a crown, like you would see like a reverse SEMA or a, a regular SEMA for those moldings is not enough. You know, Do something um, that is more contemporary or something that's paying tribute to the existing house maybe, but doing something contemporary with it. The other thing is this whole system for the gutter where you're building this block out. What's gonna, first of all, you can't provide slope on a gutter with that detail and the gutter has to slope. And, and secondly, if water does get behind, it's going to come into your EVE system and destroy it. So that's another long-term maintenance and uh, valuation issue for this property. Um, that gutter really should be outboard. It should probably be a half round, which would be lovely. Um, and you need to make sure that your whole fascia system is protected from those kind of conditions. Um, on top of that, I really believe that this house, if it's gonna be better, or equal or better than the existing needs to have the clay tile or a slate roof. The asphalt shingle is not typical in your neighborhood. And so we need to bring this up. The brick and the colors that you choose for the windows and the gutters and downspouts, those are all things that I think we've talked about. Um, and we can resolve that all, I think, uh, hopefully in the next in the, on the next round. But as far as I'm concerned right now, if we're going to approve the demo uh, with, with the idea that what is it's being replaced with is equal or greater, that we need to see this again. Did you say that we need to make it more of a modern design? It doesn't matter. He can, it just, he, this needs to be worked on more, especially with the, you know, the way that the water and the gutter is gonna work. This, if there's a buyer for this house, that would be the first detail that I would have to change. I would have to put money into this house to fix it immediately. Mr. Chairman, um, obviously I, I'd like to be deferential to the chair. Um, we've heard the comments of the other board members. I do wanna clarify something. Um, in terms of ownership, um, Alex and his wife are, are designated to act on behalf of Mr. Tom Schottenstein, who is still the owner of the property. 
I too as well um, am authorized to represent uh, Mr. Schottenstein Centrist. And that's part of the, it's not an economic hardship under your code, but the personal hardship uh, that uh, my client has experienced is their inability to close on the property uh, because they can't meet this condition to get approval for the demolition permit. Um, so again, with under your scenario, ultimate approval not being until January, arguably, um, it uh, presents a real challenge. Uh, I would acknowledge for the record that a lot of our wounds have been self-inflicted, um, but I think the level of detail that you went into, um, quite frankly, um, I started to fade there towards the end a little bit. Um, um, I, I do think that you were so specific that it, it could be accomplished um, if the other board members agree um, by submitting those additional details to staff. Um, again, I wanna be deferential to you, Chair Hire, uh, but this is the fourth, fourth time in the barrel and um, um, it, 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 it seems to me that the other members have indicated a comfort level in proceeding. So I, I was wondering if um, you would consider it possible to, uh, as you've done in similar situations, delegate that final review uh, to staff um, as opposed to the commission itself. Understood. If we did, it would be an up or down vote. Yes, sir. Uh, with us, with that condition. Yes, sir. And the board members would vote on that. And if you were not able to get a majority, then you then the demolition would be denied and you'd have to come back to us with a completely new design, be a new application. And um, both parties would have to evaluate whether they'd be able to go go forward as under the contract is currently constituted in full disclosure to the board. Next question, just I think I know the answer, but just to clarify, is it possible, Chapter Two, um, if if the board voted tonight to reach a conclusion as to the demolition aspect? Am I correct that the demolition could not occur until final design is approved? Yeah, the, the, the physical demolition yes. could not right, occur. Right. So I think one of the what you're leading to is, and it came in, I think you were one of the key applicants you wrote to worry about one thing that includes you is, uh, I think you're leaning toward uh, an approval of the demolition. I understand what your uh, hire is saying about, you know, he's looking at some of the factors for relating to um, whether or not there's justification for um, permitting the demolition. May I ask can, can we do an approval with the condition that they come back to the board for these final detail reviews? I know it's not typical, but well, here's the here's the dilemma as I see. I can see we have a desperate view on what happens going right down. I believe that my sense is that several of the board members believe that there is architectural or historical significance to this house. So that's step one. I heard at least one board member say that 
the board member has concluded that retaining the house is an economic hardship. And therefore, that is a reason to proceed. I hear another board member saying, I don't see an economic hardship here. So we're going to approve the demo. There has to be a compelling other circumstance, which is the new house knocks it out of the park. So I think what I'm hearing is from Mr. Hire's perspective, he, he in his conscience, maybe couldn't approve a demo right now because the factors have not been or addressed. We have an architecturally significant building. We don't have a compelling circumstance to say we're going to approve this because, wow, what a building. On the other hand, I think I heard Mr. Scott say, I, I think this building is architecturally significant, but it appears to him that there's an economic hardship here. Did I hear that right? Compelling circumstances. Yeah, there's there, there's mul multiples of the from the ordinance that I think they right. fall into right. and apply to this case. So I can see where Bill could say, or Mr. Heyer could say, I I'm not there because I don't see this compelling circumstance and it makes me want to approve this demolition. And until we see a great plan, a great design, how do we proceed? I hear other people say, Yeah, I understand this, it is significant, but there are several reasons to move forward. And probably Bill or P, you would say, like what I'm thinking is, I could say hey, I'm there on the demo, I can approve that, but nothing's going to get torn down because we don't have a plan, and we don't have a design that's finished, and it's too far for I'm not doing a, a staff person to approve, and we. I also think there's a consensus that an asphalt roof is not going to work. If you have to spend another fifty thousand dollars on the roof, you don't want to move forward. I don't know what a, a flight or a slight roof costs, but it's going to be an investment. So, <clears throat> so a question from my perspective, when we're done, the demo, knowing the demo cannot happen until there's a final plan approved and it's going to come back to this board, it, it, that that I can live with that, but the applicant has to know that. There's a lot of fair amount of work here to get a group plan. So that's all I have to say. I would say the other question for that too is if you can identify, I think like your hire did with some specificity, <laughs> what it is you're looking for them to have and do so that they can evaluate, you know, what that is. If it is we, have, we're, we can't approve anything without a slight roof, then that's a significant cost that 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 if there's a consensus of the board and maybe there isn't but if you know if you can identify the specific conditions that you want to see on the site plan i think that's helpful because you could approve it on the condition that it come back and be very relatively specific i'm not saying you have to make every detail obviously it's a little bit of a moving target but would that be uh, made as a motion among the board members prior to the vote it would be part of the vote. Yeah, it would be part of the vote, I think. I have a the, question. All of it. But, but because the demo <laughs> is primary, okay, the demo comes first, wouldn't we have to, somebody would have to make a motion that those conditions would allow the board to split it or make that condition of all these details? Because some not, not all these board members are going to are, have the same reasoning for the demo. Um, I don't the, the, the question, you don't all necessarily have to have the same reasoning if everybody has a reason that, you know, if, if as the board for the reason, whatever reasons you're basing on it, everybody gets there, whether it's because there is, you know, whether it's because it's not, it's an economic hardship or whether it's because of the replacement structure is far superior, but you don't believe in the economic hardship or whether it's both factors, you have right. one of the factors. So let me ask the applicant, can I? Yeah, go ahead. I, eventually I wanna get a question in here. Go ahead. If there are conditions put on this and allowing the demo to move forward with the condition that you're coming back to this board in January with the corrections and the, you know, the uh, updates that we are going to make a condition, is that acceptable to you based on what you've heard me say tonight from my, from my perspective? Do you want to ask me a question? I'm trying to. I, be it's also. I'm just let me to add a question on to his. It's 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 related. What is required on your client's behalf for closing? Uh, 
approval by this board. Of both parts or? Uh, in all candor, I, I believe the language says uh, approval of the demolition, which could arguably be both parts <laughs> or could arguably well, be part A. I think it needs to be clear. It, it, it would be both parts. I mean, I think the issue is we, we would be in agreement that maybe that the demolition could happen, but it's contingent on the approval of. Well, yeah, con contingent de demolition is always contingent on a building permit. Right. Period. Absolutely. Period. You cannot right. get a demolition permit until you've achieved a building permit. We're, we're trying to maybe help facilitate, when maybe we don't need to, some of this process to say, hey, you know, we, we think we can get to a demo based on things that we've all different argued. Maybe it doesn't happen. I don't know. But there are things in the drawings that. You've submitted that have been have, have expressed, and I agree with a lot of what Mr. Heyer said. My comment was maybe it would be remanded to staff if she, right. if they're comfortable with that. If they're not, does it sound like us. they are, Mr. Well, Chairman? To re uh, well, yeah. I don't want to speak for staff. I'm sorry. To so try to respond to your question, um, from my perception, we have one uh, board member on the record who said uh, that um, they were persuaded by. Um, the historic preservation analysis that we provided um, by who's the architect to that? Right. Uh, by Mr. Berardi. And then um, you've had another board member who uh, uh, acknowledged a compelling circumstance while at the same time acknowledging the historical significance <coughs> of the building. You've had another board member who has paid deference and homage to the architectural and historic significance, but has felt that uh, it's a, my words, not his, a prima facie case of an economic hardship because of the damage uh, done uh, by the fire to all the mechanical units. Um, you have, the, uh, if I may be so bold, the newest board member who appears uh, in the first public discussions I recall uh, on this, seem to have a comfort level with with the replacement project because we started this hearing off with a, a tacit acknowledgement by staff that we had, had looked at the demo thoroughly and that we should focus on the project and then we now have the chair who would want to uh, condition a motion of approval uh, on a second hearing um, and we have one member who has said that uh, the vote may sway on whether or not we change the roof um, so uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is is uh, filter all that uh, so I can um, advise my client what to do. So nothing you said, 90% of which I understood, um, and all of which I believe my client understood, uh, was objectionable on its face, Mr. Heyer, in terms of conditions. So um, if the, the motion was made condition on uh, amending the plan, uh, and subject to confirmation of the amendments um, that you specify, uh, I think we would be on board. Um, but if it would automatically, um, and I would leave it to the board's discretion whether uh, you're comfortable doing that, framing a motion that way. What you said to me initially is you just voted up or down um, with the conditions or without. Uh, we'd like to split the baby and try to have a conditional approval that enumerates those conditions you made with specificity so we know our target, uh, because even I understood the vast majority of them, and I'm being candid. Right. You kind of lost me there when you got into the roof section, and uh, but he, he understood it, so. I'm, I'd like to just say, the, the, in, in this has been, again, a progression, and we discover different things. I am uh, in line with, I mean, Bill, Bill knows his onions knows them well uh, and uh, um, the uh, so I'm concerned for those people in the back of the room that are going to end up with this house that they have details that are actually going to work and not lead to premature aging of the house so th so those kinds of conditions to me uh, that bill raises are doing a grand favor for the eventual owners of this house and so some of these I'm not sure you would would be in the client's mind debatable 
because if you've got a detail in terms of how the guttering is going to work uh, that will not pass the test of time, uh, now is the time to do that and to, to figure that out. So um, those kinds of, so th those are beyond an aesthetic issue in my mind. Okay. Those, are, those are related to the integrity uh, and longevity of the house and the investment that's put in the house. You don't go this far and then put on a detail uh, that's, that's, that's gonna create a failure in the house. You don't do that. That does not make any sense. The roof, that's an aesthetic issue back and forth. I understand that one. Uh, but these other issues to me are pretty fundamental uh, to a sound investment in that house. We also had commented about a special meeting for St. Charles. So if we schedule a special meeting, it's gonna be ARB. We could put both cases on that agenda. Could you explain that, please? If, if being we're not going to have a December meeting, typically. We could have a special session of the ARB, a public session of the ARB to discuss this project. But this, I, this one on the agenda, as well as St. Charles. And as long as I can give a two week notice to the neighbors, we can do that. And if we did that, would the, would the applicant be willing to table this for that special session? Yes, sir. I think that would be preferable so that we can come to a full vote on the demolition and the new construction and that everybody, all, all the conditions, whatever they are, are labeled. The reasons for the demolition or not, the reasons, for, you know, the, the criteria are all there in one vote would be preferable. Believe it or not, I am in total agreement. <laughs> we got there. So you are requesting a table until... I think he's... So that's assuming that there's a special meeting in December. We have yes. to. Yeah, so the question is. Would we would we make a motion for a special session in December? Yeah, I would. I, I would think he, first before he go that direction, I would strongly suggest that the board check their calendars and make sure that you can actually all be available for a special meeting, and um, staff can be sure that there's a location that's appropriate. So, in, so the motion would be that to a date certain mm -hmm. in December, in December, the air, the architecture review board agrees to meet in a special session regarding application number. Well, you can just have a special meeting, yeah, and you can table this application to that. You can let yep. Charles know. I, I, I would be unwilling to table this without a date being established. So I think we have to do that. 8th, 9th. December 9th. Yeah, the 9th. I got to make sure because it could be a city Christmas. Christmas party. I think it's a city Christmas. I'm looking at when. This will be much more changing. <laughs> That's going to be a mess. Sorry. I mean, Wednesday the 8th is, I don't see anything on the calendar. I'm not here. What about the 9th? Are you here on the 9th? I'm gone. Does it have to be? It's, well, does, it have, does it have to be in the evening? I know that in, in hurts some other folks that actually work for a living. But the, Does it have to be in person if you could attend by Zoom? Those don't work real well, but get complicated. Yeah. Would the applicant be willing to have the special session during the day instead of an evening? Is that yes? You know what? I am free on both those days, so if we wanted to set this, no, Larry, you, you would. Not the eighth is my amount of town. The eighth, you leave on the eighth. The ninth, you'll be here. The ninth, I'm here. The eighth is perfect then. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, I'm gonna so you could do the eighth. Uh, ninth. No, I cannot. Ninth. I can do the ninth. I can do the ninth. I can do the ninth. Let's shoot for the ninth at five o'clock. And if I've got to change it, I've got to change it. But we could shoot for that. Could I have a motion, please, then? Do we, know? Uh, does, do we need a motion or does the uh, I'll make a motion to have the meeting on September 9th at five o'clock. Table this application to December 9th at 5 p.m. Is this from either or? 
I, I, it looks to be on my calendar. I'll, I'll make motion to table this application to facilitate the presentation. Oops, that's one of the Christmas parties for seminar. Yes, yes. May, may I add it? Well, I can't add a condition as a chair. Can I add a condition as a chair or no? Can I recommend a condition or more information? I, I think the applicant should be working with the design consultant in the meantime to address oh, yeah. the issue, you know, the, the concerns. <laughs> At least I, I just want it in writing. I, I want it stated okay. in the record. Okay. And, are, and do I, are those? Um, How about the 16th? Meeting on the, we've got. November 30, December 6, December 8. Any of those days? December 6th is fine for me. What do we? December 6th, a Saturday? Monday. Oh, Monday. sorry. December 6th? 6th. December 6th. Is yeah, I'm, I'm not back in town to the 8th or to, to the 9th. So anything earlier than that, I'm not here. <clears throat> but hey, who needs me? <laughs> why, why, why is the 9th not working? I don't know. I think we could do the night. The, it's, uh, I know it's a Christmas the night party, party, but the room is available. Uh, no, no, Christmas card party. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing this. <laughs> it's not until in the evening. At yeah, the night. that's fine. I think we should set for the night because everybody can be here. Do you want to meet at five? Five o'clock. Is mm -hmm. that acceptable? Yes, sir. So what did we say? That yeah, the night at five. Let's keep it there. So moved. Can we vote on that or? Yeah. Okay. So. You yeah. Have I made a motion. Oh, you already made the motion. All right, Mr. Scott seconded it. I will second it. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Ms. Crosby? Yes. Mr. Crosser? Yes. Chairman Heyer? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> Great. We're going We're gonna to take a five minute break. Thank you for your patience. Okay, I was texting him. We aren't having a special meeting for St. Charles, are we? Can I just make that up? No, it's not a special session because they're going to come back in January with the design. Yeah, that's right. Damn. Oh, well. Well, you can have time anyway. And I'd rather have that this resolved before we wait till January. I don't want to have a session where there's two applicants on that afternoon. And, and yeah, we're both bending, so. They seem like they're far enough along. How are you? Good, how are you? Oh, man. Oh, man. I, I didn't know. 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 I didn't know.
Just have a poll. Yesterday. No help. Done thing. You already yelled at me via email. Uh, hold on. I got to make sure. I got to confirm. Hi. Hi. All right, I'm sorry. I know. You got a doctor's appointment. He's, oh, God. That's the tough part. See, I really think that, that the main mistake would be is saying so there's not a shelf under here so that she can. I hope you're. I, 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 <laughs> what do you want? What am I supposed to do about that? They can see if they can be moved up. We're going to continue our ARB meeting for November 11th. Our next application. Uh, it's old business application number ARB 2163. The address is 261 South Columbia. The applicant is Nathan Sampson. The owner is 261 South Columbia LLC. The request, the applicant is requesting architecture review and approval 
and a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition of an existing home and the construction of new single family home. Applicants are here, thank you. Yes. Please be sworn in. Okay. You state your name starting with you, sir. Nathan Sampson. Hi, Joe Miller. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth? Thank yes, you. I do. Thank you. Uh, Karen, uh, Ms. Ms. Bokor, do you have comments for us from the last you. Um, so this one, this application is also for a demolition of an existing home and a replacement of a new um, proposed home. There has been, uh, let's see, let me make sure I'm right. This table is September and October, so this is the third um, hearing. Um, the applicant has submitted all the materials that the board has asked for. The board was pretty pleased with the replacement um, structure at the last meeting, and we have gone through all the demolition as well. We can discuss anything, you know, no votes <laughs> for anything, it's all up for discussion. But to jump right to the, the um, point that we are at, the board had asked that the whole home be lowered into the ground. I can't remember if there was an exact number or one step one, or two feet, two feet, two feet, two feet. Two feet. Yes. Drop or in. out of the ground, two feet, out of the ground, two feet. Yeah. yeah which I was, yeah. And um, Mr. Sampson completely agreed. He has provided new drawings. Get them open here. Is this the right? Oh, no. Yes. No, it's there. Karen, I got to say, you definitely like the neighbor. It's impressive. I what? You move this around very, very well. It's well, it's been, it's think, think, thanks to the pandemic, I've learned with um, Zoom. But I, I wanted to point out an interesting drawing, um, which I think is very helpful, um, that the applicant has provided that shows um, the relationship of the existing home kind of superimposed on the new build from across the street to show the sight lines. Because one of the things that we asked them to do was show that by moving the structure back onto the site um, to moving the, um, so that the front was a lot further back than the original that it diminishes the, the size of the mass. Am I explaining that correctly? Maybe? Yes, that was good. Okay. I'm going to give you a chance to do it. But here is a good um, drawing of the change in height, how it, the building has been sunk into the ground. We didn't really have any other requests of this particular project that I had documented at all, except that um, to move it into the ground was critical um, to, to diminish the mass. Um, at this point, I will hand it over to you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that after our discussion at the last meeting, um, there were some very good points made, and I, and I think you know we all agreed that there's uh, some fine tuning that needed to happen from the time that this application was originally submitted and the discussions that came about over the last few months. Um, the I'll cover the uh, I guess you would say the updates here, and we can certainly go back to any other questions as needed uh, by the board uh, relative to our previous hearings. So. Uh, after our last discussion last month, um, we did a couple of things. One, we took the house, lowered it into the site 12 inches. So uh, our subfloor on the first floor that was 36 inches out of the average existing grade at the front of the house now got lowered 12 inches. Um, we also updated the detailed building section because I think in our last application, when we talked about the material change, the building section had not been updated to reflect the stucco versus stone uh, materiality. And in doing that, um, it's not a great difference, but just in you know taking away that dimension in the wall section, the roof, you know, the overall height of the building itself went down another three and a half inches. And that's just a relative to the slope of the roof and the buildup of the wall. Um, so I think in, hearing what the comments were at the last meeting, we also developed um, more of a three-quarter site section that relates the street, the sidewalk, and the positioning of the new house with sort of the, the modifications made from the last meeting to 
you know, for ourselves initially, but also trying to find a way to present this to the board uh, in a clear manner where we were talking about the character of the neighborhood, I think was where most of the comments were stemming from. So with the moves that we make, we're landing basically the first floor where whereabouts within probably an inch or so of where the first floor of that uh, existing house is now. And as outlined in our previous application as well, talking about how far back the new house sits on the site relative to the existing home. Um, we, as it's an experiential thing somewhat, we talked about, you know, how deep the house sits in the lot, you know, adjusting those heights of the roofs and the eaves and the first floor. So this diagram is basically a way to help us understand and sort of see how those, you know, the old house presence on the street relates to what we are proposing. So I think, you know, cars are lower than people walking along the sidewalk. So, you know, this is a beautiful neighborhood to walk. So we wanted to get that perspective because that's probably the most uh, extreme angle from just a street experience perspective. So what we are showing here, and because uh, that portico is a majority of the facade, we use that as a reference point for this view. We could certainly extrapolate what that uh, is relative to um, the eve of the main body of the house as well. And we got some dimensions to talk about. The existing portico line of sight is that first top line showing just, you know, that is certainly at the peak of that, which we relate to the roof line, which is the line directly below that. So second from the top and how that line intersects with the outline of the old house and then shows where that falls on the um, elevation of the proposed location of the structure that we've designed. The last line on the bottom is existing eave height. So again, because that portico is the majority of the facade, we use the corner of that or the eave of that as the projection line to show that it's fairly close from a viewpoint with the setback of the house to where it is now. I think that if we're comparing sort of eave of the house to eave of the house, now we're just, I think, just at three feet higher than the existing house, although stepped back. Um, the overall height of the building now to the top of the roof is 36 feet and the 40 feet is the zoning limit, but also this lowering of the roof in a couple of different ways helps it tie back into the streetscape, which is, uh, I think on a, on the top slide, but can we flip back to that just to sort of understand what that line is? You know, previously we were certainly a wee bit higher. So this gives you a feel for the existing houses on the street, the outline of the existing house on this lot uh, with the proposed house overlaid on it and the relationship between the two. Um, the existing eave height that on the existing house, so the main body of the house we're talking about, uh, we had it from our laser scanned at about 21 feet, two and a half inches, plus or minus maybe an inch, depending on where you measure it from. I think we were going from the average grade height at the front of the existing building. Um, and now we've our proposed Eve height is uh, 24 feet two, um, which is that three foot difference I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Um, with those differences, I think that it's helpful to see that diagram just from a, a viewpoint perspective. Um, also, uh, I think in the interim from our last uh, discussion, we submitted a letter from the relatives of the um, residents who built the house in 1926 to 28 um, in support of the project. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as we go through those, trying to make sure we sort of check the boxes for the concerns of the board and how and outline a way to understand that graphically so that we could discuss it. Um, you know, <laughs> in stepping back just a bit, you know, I think that over the last few months, you know, we've talked to what is a nationally recognized historic preservation architect um, outlining just his perspective on this project in the neighborhood and he's a resident as well. Um, 
letters of support from neighbors and also the family of the original owners of the house. And certainly um, being careful, but also very uh, conscientious about making sure that we are, that this is a dialogue and a discussion between the board and myself and the owners to try and make this um, certainly feel in place and feel appropriate and uh, develop a proposed design that would replace this existing house that the neighborhood uh, can be proud of. So I'm happy to go over any other questions we have about the updates or previous uh, discussions that we've had over the last couple of months. If anyone has a question. Thank you. Um, is there anyone withstanding that would like to speak about this project? Withstanding, please. Could you state your name and your address, please? James Harris. I uh, live at 67 South Parkview Avenue. I, did, I don't live within 200 feet, and therefore I did not receive notice, and I understand that's a pertinent detail for standing. However, I believe I'm directly economically impacted. Uh, I don't live in the far corner of uh, Bexley. This is not a new porch proposal. This is a demolition. Um, um, Ms. Cunningham, is, does he have standing? I'm 11 homes away. I own a historic home in the same neighborhood, the Bullet Park neighborhood of Bexley. So the demolition of this home directly affects my own investment of what my lot value is worth. How easy a demolition of my house would be if I'm required to create a historical easement for my property, or if I would more easily be able to sell in the future my house uh, raised of its current structure. On behalf of the applicant, Ms. Cunningham, may I speak to that? Yes, we actually it would be, specific. it's the finding of the board to determine, but the, the issue on standing is whether you're directly and adversely affected by whatever is happening. Um, so 200 feet is a notice requirement under the code, but that doesn't automatically guarantee standing one way or the other. Standing is based on the facts and circumstances of every case. So it's up to the board based on the evidence you hear to determine whether you believe that that somebody who wants to speak is directly and adversely affected, has an interest unique to them, not a general city interest that's unique to them. If um, I may just e reason. So. on behalf of the applicant, if I may just briefly speak to that, that is correct. The law of Ohio is that to have standing in an administrative decision such as this, an administrative hearing, the person must express unique and specific harm to them separate and apart from that of the general public. Ohio courts have typically found that properties that are adjacent and contiguous to the affected property may have unique and individualized harm specific to them. However, away from that, often the harms expressed, property values, effects upon my neighborhood, are generalized to the rest of the public and it would grant standing to everybody in the area. And that is not consistent both with your law and with Ohio case law. And frankly, that's why a lot of municipalities uh, in and around Central Ohio specifically limit such comments to contiguous and adjacent properties. So we would contend that this gentleman, while I'm certain that his concerns are genuine, they are generalized and shared in common with the surrounding public and we would object to his lack of standing. Well, Kevin, would you uh, agree with how that interpretation? Um, in general, but not specifically, because it just it depends on what the circumstances, what the use is, what the circumstances it are. So, if it's a you know a manufacturing facility with significant odors, that's one thing. If you smell them a half mile away, or if there's a significant impact on your property based on what is being proposed there. That's one thing, but um, another thing, it, it really do, is supposed to be a direct and adverse impact on a person, on them, and their, their property, their use, their, some interests that they have beyond just um, a general community interest. And sure. what, what you've stated is that the impact on you is a general impact. The impact on me is specific in this regard. Uh, Bullet Park lots are million dollar lots. This is a million dollar property there. Uh, it's a million dollar property down the road. I'm 11 homes away. 
the allowance of easy demolition versus more strict demolition of this house or any other directly affects my economic interest because I need to know, can I easily demolish my home to be fair to other applicants? Would that be considered specific or general to this property? Um, that, an interest in the application of the law would be, to me, would be a general interest. Um, if you have some direct specific impact to your house <laughs> from, from something that's being proposed, then that's a specific interest. With regard to my home, I have an 1893 home in need of renovation. And the specific economic impact is if I'm allowed to easily demolish my home or not, or if I'm required to expend uh, monies on investments in legal easements uh, to restrict historical demolition of my home or not, as well as the fact that there's a limited number of available building lots in this particular neighborhood of Bexley. And with specificity, the scarcity of vacant lots or demo lots directly affects the value of my lot. If it's extremely scarce, if this demo is not permitted, the value of my property goes up as well as everybody else because it makes available building lots even scarcer. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I think the dialogue's already started. Yes. And I think so we, since we have not shut down that dialogue, I would support it listening, but I think we should have that be a timed I agree. discussion and not a question and answer period, but only a statement. Thank you. So I will give you uh, four minutes. And if you would be sworn in, please. My name is James Harris. I got it. I do. <laughs> Thank you. Please go ahead. Very briefly, I have submitted a letter requesting that this permit be denied and with exhibits. Was that accepted for the record for this particular? Yeah, that was submitted to the members. Therefore, I will be very concise. The bullet points that I would like to hit upon are, I do feel that this property is historic. Uh, I'm not an architect. However, it was listed in the Columbus uh, Journal back in when it was built. Very few properties were profiled that way, but in 1928, at the height of the uh, Roaring Twenties, it was profiled. The family as well has very strong historic associations with Columbus, the old Westwater Mansion downtown, demolished. The few Westwater family houses that may remain, I believe, are significant in the sense that the Westwater family was one of the, the most prominent Columbus families, uh, James Westwater being Columbus's most famous abolitionist. With regard to demolition of this value, property and the increased value, I don't have a specific opinion on how beautiful the new house may be with regard to my request, other than an economic comment that we've got a lot here worth approximately $1.3 million. And I'm not convinced that spending one or $2 million on a new house will dollar up for dollar increase the value of the resultant property. If you look at the current owner's opinion of the house in the exhibits, they have termed this house when they marketed it, as you can see on Zillow, it's a true Bexley treasure. This is what the current owner <laughs> or immediately preceding owner and it's difficult to tell if they're related or not with the current LLC owner. This is what the current, that the, the then current listed owner uh, suggested about the house. And yet the prior testimony contradicted that by saying it's basically of no account. We have a difference in marketing and, and then convenient opinion to justify a demolition later. I won't go on any further other than I have submitted my letter and my thoughts, and uh, hopefully there'll be an opportunity for you to uh, re review it. And I thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much.
if I may, Mr. Heyer, uh, briefly respond. Please. Uh, and I will be brief because uh, I tend to do better when he's talking more and I'm talking less. Uh, Joe Miller, we have appreciated the specific feedback over the last uh, several months, especially last month. And we feel that we've listened closely and frankly, Nate agrees, this is a better home as a result. This would be a hundred year asset to the community in response to Ms. Tony and Mr. Heyer in particular, we've lowered the height in response to Mr. Heyer and Ms. Tony in particular, we've lowered the second floor Eve uh, by the request of amount. I know Ms. Krosky, you've been here and have listened to the discussion. Um, and while I'm very respectful of Mr. Harris's opinions, the only expert opinions before you from a national, uh, re nationally recognized historic preservationist is that large and old doesn't necessarily equate to historical or architectural significance. The opinions are in the record of Mr. Loversridge that on each of the factors under 122305 that you must consider, this home is not historical or architecturally significant. And we are gratified to have support of Ms. Westwater, Ms. Westwater in the record. Um, and Mr. Scott, while you have correctly observed that some of the additions to the home are quite unfortunate, you must consider the structure as a whole, that that's how the ordinance reads. Um, and so we believe that we've not only met the requirements for demolition, we do believe that we've satisfied one criteria that I know has been important to this board tonight and in the past, namely 122305F is the proposed replacement plan superior to retention of the existing structure. Thanks to each of your input, we believe that it is. And finally, uh, Mr. Hellman, I've given a lot of thought to your concern over the last month about does this create a test case? Um, respectfully, every piece of property is unique. And in fact, that, that's not my opinion, that's the law of Ohio, that um, every piece of property is unique. And I've had the privilege of appearing before this board before, as well as being here the last several months. And I know this is not a board that would somehow abdicate its responsibility to fully consider each case before. You're gonna be presented with different circumstances in every case, some perhaps more compelling than this one and certainly some that will be less. Uh, we submit to you that this will give an amazing home to this community for many decades to come. And based upon the factors of the ordinance, in this case, based on the evidence in this case, we have met those factors and it would not carry over into other matters. And so we do ask for your approval this evening. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who uh, has standing that would like to speak to this project? Anyone else? Uh, Nathan, would you like to come back up? And, and then I'd like to have comments from the board, please. We have other applications to tonight and I'd like to move, move, um, move through them. Yeah, I'm happy to move on to questions okay. and comments. Great. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's have comments from the board, uh, Mr. Hellman. Sure. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, this is one that we have struggled with, uh, and we'll probably continue to struggle with. Um, I guess in my mind, we can, we all have to come to our rationale for the decisions that we make. Um, and in my mind, a lot has been hung on the term architecturally significant, um, whether this house is, and it's been deemed not architecturally significant. So in that sense, if it's not architecturally significant, it's architecturally insignificant. When I look then at the decisions we've made in the past, uh, we have three demolitions we've done on Columbia. Uh, the Bluth house, I believe, was architecturally insignificant. I believe the house, the white mess that was a uh, couple of houses up on the, uh, from, from Bryden, that was architecturally insignificant. Uh, a little bit of a battle with Keener Johnson's house, a little Dutch colonial, uh, was cute. Uh, so that slides up on the scale, but probably architecturally insignificant. The North Roosevelt house, clearly architecturally insignificant. And on the one on Francis, maybe a little bit marginal. This house, unfortunately for me, is a bridge too far. 
Uh, it is, in, in my mind, it is not an architecturally insignificant house. It does not follow in the track of our exact of the precedents that we've taken to this point. Um, obviously, and I've made no comments about the house. How, how can you? The house is wonderful. It's a great house. I mean, we understand that. Um, I just wish it were on a different spot and had a different lot. Uh, so uh, I will obviously not be in support of the demolition. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, again, going back to the codified, codified ordinance uh, of demolition and removal of the existing structures, um, C1 goes, takes a strike to that same statement that uh, Mr. Hellman had referenced is the structures demolished or removed is not historically or architecturally significant. Uh, I do not believe the house is historically significant. Um, architecturally significant is a, is a much uh, harder one to determine. Um, looking at the house, uh, I, I am continuing in my position that uh, the sides and specifically the rear of the house with the additions, um, with, I, I think there's hard argument to find that those are significant at all. Uh, they're, they're fairly poorly done. Uh, there's no architectural detail, their scale is off. So looking at the, the, those sides and rear of the house, um, one could argue that those are not architecturally significant. The front of the house and its detailing um, is of a style and, and, a, and of a character uh, that's a, a little out of uh, not found commonly in Bexley, but has other properties which we've even seen photos of, um, and and does lean towards architecturally significant. Um, I think that architecturally significant term for me also ties into um, the ordinance in when you're looking for uh, section D criteria to determining the preservation significance. Uh, and there's five there in that category, uh, age and condition, quality of the structure, the importance of the structure to the character and quality of the neighborhood, the significance of the design and style of the structure to the historical, architectural and cultural development of the city. And five being the impact on the city's real property tax base. Uh, I think three and four is where the front of the house um, loses its argument for demolition because the importance of the structure to the character and quality of the neighborhood, I think is undeniable. I think that that the eclectic mix of the different houses uh, or the more, let's say the older houses specifically, uh, this house fits into. Um, the significance of the design and style of the structure to the historical architectural and cultural development of the city, I think it also plays into that. There's history to this this house. There's a history to this uh, this, this development. We, we, there's articles on it. There's all sorts of things that tie together. Um, but in saying that, when you look at the totality of the project in the house, um, and I weigh all of the different characteristics, it, it gets very difficult and it's quite close to leaning either way. And I'm, I guess I'm not totally convinced, but I know that when I look at the overall project, the rear and sides of the house are not architecturally significant to me, and that's three quarters of the facades. Um, so that's kind of where I am. When you weigh in the, the new design, and you look at the overall site planning of the new design, uh, I said it in the last meeting that I think the, the design of the new house is, is uh, very well done. I think it's even better now that uh, you come back with the revisions. Uh, the the, the, the the impacts of that house and that new design within the, sh the street does fit within the character and the improvement of the, sh the street, the, the streetscape character of that street. Uh, it does not take away from that in any way. It does not impact other houses on its scale or, or um, design or its characteristics. It's not out of place. I think it fits in. So that argument of the new design, and we're not talking about specific details here, more of the big picture for this, um, is, is a strong argument that the replacement structure is significantly well-designed and, and arguably increases the character and, and the, even the, the property values of the city's real property tax of the neighborhood. I'm not convinced that the, keeping the existing house does that as well as the new. Um, so I, it's, hard, it, it's, it's, it's still a very difficult decision. Uh, I don't think I have a very determined uh, outcome of how this is going to play, but I think in that whole, uh, no, in that overall uh, 
looking at the totality of all of that, I think there's, there is an argument for demolition based on architectural significance. So I guess that's like it. That was clear enough. Other comments, uh, Ms. Strasser? Well, I, for me, what we have on the record, um, a report from a reputable architect that indicates that the building is not architecturally or historically significant. On the flip side, I have board members who are well-educated and trained in that topic. So I give deference to both, um, but on balance, um, because of the additions and the totality of the building, I'm comfortable with my conclusion that the building is not historically or architecturally significant worthy of preservation. Uh, as I said last week or last month, it wouldn't be my decision to do it this way. It's not my personal preference, but my personal preference is not relevant. So um, for me, the quality, um, it, it, in addition, um, even if a conclusion is it is architecturally historically significant, this um, replacement building is a compelling piece of residential architecture. The quality is outstanding. It will serve this test of time, unlike the, you know, some other applicants. Um, and I am in favor of approving the plans tonight and the demolition, provided that any, what I would consider small details remaining to the extent there are any, we worked out with staff. Um, I think we have a high degree of confidence in the expertise and professionalism of this architect and the quality of the materials are clear. It will be a grand addition to the street and will we miss what is there a little bit, but I suspect not for long. Thank you, Ms. Kroski. I'm gonna get simple. I agree with Pete. I agree with Joanne. <laughs> And uh, I would like to just offer one design suggestion, if that's all right. <laughs> I'm only leaning forward so far because it's hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. Animals walking two by yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I should have spoken louder. I, I said I agree with Pete. I agree with Joanne in their assessments. And uh, the one design thing that I would say is I'm not a huge fan of the stucco base, um, partly because personally I have a stucco home mm -hmm. and part of it has a stucco base that goes down. I don't think it's a very durable, I, it's durable, it's a durable material. I just don't think it's great to have going down to the base. And uh, I, I really like, um, the, I, I'm assuming, is that stone in the main entry right there? What is, I, I couldn't find, what is that yeah, right there? Yeah. Correct. That the, so, in the last hearing, we talked about the home being uh, stucco finish. Yes. Which, with, yeah. with, uh, cut stone, limestone accent at the front entry. Yeah, the rest I, would be detailing in stucco. And there was a number of examples of pictures that we looked at because okay. it was relative to the time period, 20s yeah. and 30s. Yep, common. I know, I have yep. a 1920 yep. home, yep. stucco, got yep. it. Um, I really, I like that stone. I, I, I just feel like it would be really nice along the base if you took from that band down and had that go around. I think it would ground your build, like your house better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would tie it in because you have the stone at each of your entries. Um, even, even some of the, you know, you have like a, what is that? The North elevation around the door uh, there. So right, I just think it would like tie it in a little bit better. You're simply saying consider that possibility. Yeah, consider that possibility. Yeah. And could I just make a comment relative to that just as, uh, as we move forward? The, you know, the stucco material, there's certainly, you know, different uh, aspects, aspects of stucco and certainly with building code now, there's, you know, a break at the bottom for moisture sure. you know, absorption, all those good things. Um, but I think, you know, there is a way to do it correctly. And also this uh, particular drawing, although they're smattered in there, the landscaping, which will need to be approved as well uh, mm -hmm. by the city, is not necessarily shown in here because sure. um, uh, that would probably be too bold of me to 
make a stab at that because that's not my field of expertise. Yeah. yeah. It's fine. It's a suggestion. For okay. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll round out the comments by, um, I guess, agreeing with Ms. Krosky. I think that's a great idea for the longevity of this house is to have that stone belt course. Mm -hmm. um, we know that this is not an economic hardship on this project. Um, I do see in your building sections that there are some materials that um, I think could be better. Um, for instance, and I appreciate all of the natural materials you're using, the stucco, the slate, but with a graduated slate, is five eighths roof sheathing really enough? Is that enough to support your, your system? And then the thickness of your stucco, the stucco bands, mm -hmm. Um, are those precast stucco bands because they have joints in them? Are they really going to have joints in them the way you're showing on the those, elevations? Those would be tool joints. Like it's a build up, it's a build up base that this stucco goes on on one coat over all of them with the tool joint uh, in there. You know, a lot of times, as you know, uh, that stucco detailing to make it somewhat more authentic, you know, that was used as a material also as a as a stone like material. So some of those right. detailings we're trying to carry through. Right, except in the 1920s, stucco was, you know, three inches thick. Yeah. And now it's, right. you know, just a quarter inch. Yeah. So I do worry about the, you know, the value of the property if, if you're not gonna use traditional lime stucco and that will have that kind of longevity. And therefore, Ms. Krosky's mm -hmm. uh, request that that be stone will add to the longevity of this house by not having that thin stucco going down the grade. Is that yeah. something that you would be willing to except as a condition? The, I think we're sort of talking about two different things. One is maybe a more traditional type of stucco application that's sturdier. Yes. Versus, I, it, they're both ways to help certainly the longevity of the house and the maintenance of the house going down to grade. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, in this application, certainly we've gotten um, this to a certain point that in development that you know helps to show what this proposed structure will look like with although you know we've delved into that section to help explain that i think that the, there's probably still things on my plate that we need to work through a little bit to get that exactly right down to the inch right, right. and so that stucco application there now is probably inch plus which would be i guess my the farthest you'd go. Um, and then the projections of the surrounds would be plus or minus another inch or so. Related to some of the other historical stucco houses uh, and the relief uh, found in those details, but it's a fine tuning. I, I Understood, yeah. thank you. Um, I think this is, uh, for those of us architects on this board and for uh, really everyone on this board, it is really emotionally difficult to be presented with a beautiful house built in the 1920s that is desired to be torn down in our city. The reason why we're all here on this board, as you know, is because we love Bexley. We love the architecture of Bexley. And we have to be able to <laughs> balance the needs of a growing city that is you know, bound uh, by a de definitive border. Um, and yet preserve the beauty that we have here in our architecture. And you know, some neighborhoods are more fortunate to be able to do things like put on large additions or to do a demolition to provide a larger and uh, equal or more beautiful house. Um, so my, my feelings about the house that exists are that uh, despite previous testimony, um, I do believe that the original house, and I'm not talking about the additions. And when I think of this rule about totality, um, I'm not sure that I need to say that if, uh, you know, the main block of the house built in 1927 is architecturally significant that I necessarily have to say that everything on the house is architecturally significant or vice versa. I think it's my prerogative as a board member to state my opinion that I believe the original block of this house built in 1920, in the 1920s, 1927, 28, 
is architecturally significant for the following reasons. That the original house, which is that original 1927 house, has an important part of the has been an important part of the character of its neighborhood. All of these come from the directive for the ARB to protect and enhance the quality of architecture in Bexley. Um, B, the age and condition of the original house are good. I'm talking about the exterior. C, the building massing of the original house is historically well proportioned. D, the front portico of the house is historically well designed and proportioned and detailed with the attenuated square piers, moldings, pediment, tympanum, with the oculus window and plaster swags, and including the second floor Chippendale wood railings. Very well designed. E, that the English bond brick veneer is historically well executed. F, that the federal brick jack arches over windows and fan lights and the fan light over the front entry are also historically well executed. G, the windows with brick molds, real shutter and shutter dogs and, and the dormers are historically well proportioned and detailed. H, that the slate roof is intact and historically well executed. I, that the gable rakes and return eaves and gable windows and vents are historically well designed and executed. Based on that, I would say that the house is architecturally significant. Um, and whereas there is no substantial economic hardship for the cause of demolition, and whereas the maintaining, that maintaining the structure is feasible and the existing structure has no adverse effect on the neighbors, that brings us to the new plan having a compelling uh, uh, you know, reason or that there's compelling evidence that the, that the new design is equal or superior to the existing. I struggle with that one because it's, it's like apples to oranges, a historic building versus a new building uh, from a historic, historic preservationist and architect, a historic architect's point of view, as you know, they're very different. You know, you can have an outside that's well proportioned, but you, you know, we, we have like x-ray vision. We know what's in those walls and we know the longevity. We know that it's not a bearing wall condition anymore. It, you know, that there's, there's a wood frame structure instead of a brick frame structure and so on. So it's very difficult to say that one is superior than the other. We're trying to, to build uh, with modern construction and, and we have to do that. We, we're not going to go back to doing bearing walls. I know that. Um, Brick, brick bearing walls. Um, so how do we get this house to be architecturally superior than the one that is there? And I think you've, 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 um, you've won that argument um, on a number of fronts for me. Uh, one is the proportion of the house, the large windows, the uh, first floor being what, you, what we had requested it being two feet off of the existing grade, that the eave height was brought down um, as requested because the house to the north is, is a beautiful English Georgian revival house that has a very low parapet. Um, you've set the house back in order to provide that distance so that the height of the house, even though you're only eight inches higher than what I requested, um, I had asked between 21 and 23 feet, and that was kind of a condition, but we talked about that if you had moved it back, that that visual would, you know, allow you some flexibility, remember? Yep. And that you've done that. So I would say for a new build um, and, a, and a demo, you've done everything that has been asked for, for a project of this caliber. Um, and so based on that, you know, I would say that we, that I would be comfortable with you moving forward with the project. Those are my comments. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the board or from, from the applicant? So I guess we would then move to a vote. Yes. We did not vote on its architectural significance because I've already heard from the board from several members that they do not feel that it's architecturally significant. Therefore, a vote. If we did, I mean, we could vote for it as, as a, um, we could vote on it just so that um, we have a record. Because I think it's important for precedent that we do that. So could I have a motion for that? The, I believe the vote, there's a vote for a demolition and then a vote for the house. Well, no, this is, we're actually gonna make a motion prior to that 
to, that the board is going to take a vote on whether the house is architecturally significant or not. And why are we doing that? Because it sets the precedent for the... Um, but that's just one reason. There's so many other reasons we've talked about. We went through that over and over again. So you're going to isolate one thing and when there's all the other things we've talked about. So I, I'm, I'm certainly not in favor of that. And Bill's point was that if the uh, majority of the board believes that the property is not architecturally or historically significant, then the other factors I don't believe that. I don't think that's correct. And worthy of preservation, the economic factors, all of those, the code does not say uh, this one is worth 50%, this one's worth 25 and 30. Uh, I don't think that's I don't think that's a logical conclusion to draw. And I'd ask legal counsel to yeah, right. That, right. I thought we uh, discussed this in that the threshold is is it either is or it's Historically or architect architecture significant or worthy of preservation, or it is not. And uh, if it is, then we have to do the next step. That's the way I but I'll ask you. So ultimately, the decision, the ultimate decision in, in for you to make is whether or not a certificate of appropriate is going to be issued that's going to allow demolition and the plan. Um, Part of the issue with that is, of course, how you get there in your analysis, which is if you determine that it's architectural significant, there's no exception to that. There's no exception to call it that you would agree um, applies. Then your answer would be, oh, I don't grant the appropriate. So that is the first. I think it is historically significant. Your end game is a certificate of appropriateness. You can't get that unless you agree the demolition is appropriate. But the, que the question at hand is, is this, is the, this was what we talked about in our, uh, in our retreat. Okay. So there's a difference of opinion on what is, is, is there a particular hierarchy in this? And in the retreat, we determined that yes, there was, that it has to be architecturally significant or not. And from there follows the others. Mr. Hellman disagrees. I did. So, it, so the, the ordinance, which would require demolition to get to get that, and, yeah. and that each we can each get there in a different way. You can each get there in a different way, but under the, the way that you it, it directs you to look at it is to say if you find that it is historically um, or architecturally significant and worthy of preservation, the answer is no. You can't grant a certificate of appropriateness unless. You find there are exceptions to that that would allow you to do so in your code. I, yeah, my, my, my opinion is that it does not, those are three separate things historically significant, architecturally significant, and worthy of preservation. That, and we're taking one thing among those three and saying that's the dominant reason because I believe this has even is, is worthy of preservation. I also think it's architecturally significant, but I think it's also worthy of preservation. So, uh, but I don't care. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I'm in the minority and I do that. So that's fine. So do do as you, uh, as you wish. Can we really just present a motion to, to grant the certificate of appropriateness and demolition? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. But in your findings, you say how you got there. Right. And then people yeah, can vote that up and down. So this, this is the vote for demolition and the design. This can't, I don't right. think we should be voting on my impression we shouldn't vote for the appropriateness for whatever reason and then vote for that i think it's all one vote well as we did in the previous applicant i i think you can vote on the demolition and also vote on the architecture i think you can do both it's not just I've one yeah and i just make notes listening to conversations yeah. and hopefully i've captured do we have any conditions on? or recommendations well that that was what i was it was my impression from our retreat that if we did, that we would make a motion within the board to determine if it was architecturally significant and worthy of preservation or not. Okay. And then if it was, or if it was, if it was, then did it meet another condition? And we would state that publicly in that motion. But you're saying that we could actually state that in the final findings of fact with conditions. Okay, but not everybody's going to agree to that. Therefore, they're, they're going to have to vote no 
if they disagree with the way that we got there. Ms. Cunningham, if I can offer a, a thought, because I, I understand the concern about consistent in the results. Yes. We start parsing it up by voting consistent votes. Could the board not approve the certificate of appropriateness, which includes demolition, with simply a finding upon consideration of the facts and evidence before them that this application satisfies the many necessary criteria of 1223.05? And that allows each member to quote unquote vote their conscience based on their own rationale and methodology to get to the same result. Uh, I understand. I think the board has been trying to move in a direction of making specific findings to support their decisions. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I guess it's a specific finding that you met the code without finding how you got there. Um, yeah, it, it is the record of each person's um, statements. Sure, but statements um, are not the decision of the board. Yeah, it, it, if, if it's going to be the decision of the board, it has to be. <clears throat> part of a motion that's voted on as a majority of the members well you can make statements about how the different members felt feel and if that's the way you want to get there it's possible the end game is the certificate of appropriateness and you don't get that without demolition and if you can't get past historic significance then um you you can't qualify under the demolition statute for a certificate of appropriateness so Right, unless there's there are compelling circumstances. And I think members have tried to articulate that. If you're comfortable with that as a board, I think as a board, there have been concerns about that being appropriate and it being part of the findings so that these all stand on the facts and circumstances of each case. Yeah, I, I guess it was my hope, but that's fine, uh, that we could vote on the demolition and also then vote on the architecture because obviously my concern is the demolition I would like to be in support of the house now that the demolition question is pretty much established. But that's just me. Would it be acceptable to make a motion the fact that the finding of fact that um, whereas or just a reminder of the fact that the board as a group. Yeah, my last comment, I talked too much. Just, I'm, I'm more comfortable with that because what I don't think you want to leave in your minutes and in your record is this thing went up or down based on architectural significance because that's not what I'm hearing from everybody. Right. It was the sum total of the pieces and you do not want to, in my mind, you do not want to create that precedent out there uh, because you will you will rue that day because you'll see this come back. Well, here, you said this was boom and none of the other factors are showing up or talked about. So that's, uh, just be thoughtful about that. That's my last comment. So to me, that seems like actually the findings, whereas there was a lack of consistency in the that the demolition is justified. And therefore, this could be appropriate. This should be issued, but I would make that motion. And the findings, in fact, I don't know if you have conditions or recommendations for the design because you're tied together. Those were not conditional, according to Ms. Krosky. They were, those were just a recommendation, correct? A more uh, it's water table but yeah. certainly the quality of construction is i think a shared concern between the comments about how to deal with how that house meets the grade um instead of stucco yeah well, we would strongly consider it i think you've seen you take your feedback seriously yeah. just to snap yeah. decisions yeah so is that a condition? 
For my motion, I would not make that condition. Someone else would have to make it. Well, I think that those final details would be um, would be worked out with the design consultant. Hang on. But okay. to, just to note for okay. the record that this board strongly, you know, favors the materials that give this house its longevity, which would be equal to or superior than the house that's there. Yep. So yep. based on um, Ms. Drosser's motion, would you be able to give us the findings of fact based on that mo motion? Hang on a minute. Ms. Strasser, would you please muster, would you please make that motion again for the board, and then we'll take a vote. Here's where it's awesome to have a court reporter. <laughs> Just so we can have somebody second. Demolition is justified or, by the uh, map and that demolition uh, or a certificate of appropriateness that will uh, allow the demolition of property is appropriate based on prior criteria, including the qualities and uh, meets compelling circumstances provided by the architectural significance of quality of structure. And the superior to tension of the existing structure. Um, a certificate of appropriateness should be issued for the plan submitted and reviewed at the November 11th, 2021 meeting with the following conditions that the construction documents for replacement structure need to be approved under a building permit prior to demolition permit being issued. Height measurements at grade floor plates and ridge line be provided marked on site and approved by staff. The landscape plan is to be reviewed and approved by the Beckford Tree and Public Garden Commission. No trees can be removed, can be removed until a landscape plan has been approved. A preservation plan for existing trees should be submitted in accordance with 1223.04b. Final design to be reviewed and approved by the city's design consultant and all minor changes to the design are subject to approval of the residential design consultant. Thank you. You've heard the findings of fact and the decision of the board. Do you understand these conditions will be part of the application? Yes, I do. May I have a, a motion? Second. Second. Ms. Rose, please call the roll. Okay. Um, I will. Mr. Scott? Yes. Crosby? Yes. Mr. Howard? No. Great house, but no. Yes. Your application has been approved. All right. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our next application, we move on to new business, is um, application number is a BZAP 2147. The address is 81 North Drexel. Uh, the, there's the owner and applicant on this. Yeah. The uh, Applicant is Nathan Sampson. The owner is, I don't see that on here. Uh, consecutive primes. Okay, I'm sorry, repeat that. Okay, it's not on my, it's not on my uh, agenda. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'll just read it from there. The applicant is Keith Witt and the owner is Consecutive Primes LLC. The applicant is requesting a recommendation to the Board of Zoning and Planning for architecture review and approval and a certificate of appropriateness for a pool, pool house and fence in the front yard. You've already been sworn in. 
uh, yes. Mr. Sampson. So if you would, um, well, actually I would ask that uh, uh, Ms. Volkor give us her staff report on this. Last year. Yeah. Um, I think we could put the site plan maybe first and I can walk through the, the variance requests and then we can go and then zoom into the, the actual pool house uh, in design. Mr. Sampson, I would just ask, and this has been a long evening, that as a pool house, if you could keep your comments, you know, concise, please. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Um, or the uh, one more down. Okay, that's an outline not showing planting from the, the landscape design plans are in that packet, but this just gives you a clear idea because we, we are um, asking for a couple of variances uh, for this project. Um, one of them uh, relates to the fence surrounding the property. Um, one of them, or you know, two of them are uh, based around the excessive deviation of the location of the house uh, on the site. And at some point, we talked about this last year, what is typically the front of the house on a corner lot, which is the short side, which is Drexel, which is where the address is. I think based on previous applications over the years, um, somewhere in there, Clifton got designated or changed to the uh, front or the frontage uh, of the property. So with the location of the house, the, what is called the front yard is really the only yard that we've got to work with here. So, um, the, the fence uh, variances that we're asking for uh, is, I think, um, a deviation of just a couple of inches from the guidelines of 48 to 50 inches as far as the fence is concerned, which is a metal picket fence that is concealed within plantings along the perimeter. What we're proposing to do is take down the six foot fence uh, that is there now, uh, replace that with what is basically um, going to be a protective fence, but also a fence that complies for uh, pool protection, uh, which will be hidden again in that planting. Now, uh, it gets a little bit technical on the fence in some ways because, you know, what the code talks about a 72 inch high fence based on the mean average grade height between the property line and the setback. So I can go into that a bunch or we can uh, ask questions about it later for the sake of time. Uh, but the, the two inch deviation for the average fence height is simply to overcome uh, small deviations in grade to help them try and keep that a straight fence. The um, height uh, deviation from that mean grade, which is a chart in, this, in the landscape package that shows that is simply the same, yeah. I, I just want to make sure that we, we just want to focus on the elevations of the project. Oh, the, the zoning board, the, oh, oh the I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know if you need to make a recommendation for the zoning. We, we are making a recommendation. Just to be clear, just to be clear, but this is the board making a recommendation for the Very good. I can dive right in to the pool pavilion. Okay. So as we talked about, excessive deviation of the house on the lot, creating basically the usable front yard space that we see along Clifton. So uh, what we're proposing, as you can see in the plan, is a pool and a pool pavilion that runs parallel to the historic structure and the addition that we talked about uh, a number of months ago. You know, uh, besides their location, um, we're not requesting any deviations from 
a variance standpoint besides maybe a couple inches of height based on the parapet of the pool house. Um, the pool house itself is a stucco structure uh, with columns that's open on both sides. It has a central sort of utility and storage core in the middle, but overall is left open with um, you know, the ability to grill out there next to, and it, basically the pool sits in between the pool pavilion and the house offer privacy. Um, there is a elevation as well in that package just showing the street view and the model of the pool pavilion is actually in there. And we're just showing the proposed planting along Clifton as a street view of what that, what will be visible, I guess, from uh, the sidewalk. The section at the bottom there is just a scale relative of the pool pavilion to the house. You know, it's meant to sit down low in the landscape and not be an object that's sort of uh, put out there, understanding that it is located in what is considered the front yard. We wanna be very careful about the scale of that. I can go into questions about that, it's just a... I think there's going to be a number of comments. Is there anybody with standing that would like to speak about this project? Seeing none, um, we can have the board uh, ask questions or comments, please. Ms. Strasser. Um, I'll chalk it up to the lateness of the night. I have no comments. Okay. I could say I'd like to but that's not neither here nor there. Ms. Uh, Krosky. Um, can you go to, I guess, the site plan? Sorry, thank you. Can you go to the site plan so I can just sort of see over here? Yeah, or one of the other ones. I just want to see like what implant, can you zoom in? Yeah. This doesn't want to. Um, it might, for a holistic understanding of this, it might be best to go to the landscape. Plan. Yeah, where is that? Where's the landscape plan? Uh, you pulled it up um, earlier. It's in one, there it is. Yeah, I think what oh. I'm wondering about is what is that rectangular box? Is it a, is that the pool equipment is in there? Where? Right there. That uh, She just circled it right there. Right there? Yeah. Yes. Like how loud is that? That's the pool equipment. The pool equipment is set back uh, within the code guidelines from the property line. Yeah. It's just facing the neighbor. And I know that Sure. And it There's is walled some, in yeah. for visual and sort of noise considerations. Here. Yeah, I understand. It's just, I know they've had some issues with multiple things going on over here. And yeah. is, is there a way that, does that have to be in that location adjacent to their property? Could it move someplace towards, I don't know, uh, what, what way is north here? I guess the south. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, I think that there, there's an efficiency, certainly, with the design of it for the pool equipment working mm -hmm. properly and meeting the sort of guidelines of the <laughs> zoning and architectural code. You know, we're trying to wall that off for both, you know, some noise and planting around it for also noise and visual protection. Um, it, it starts, other available spaces start to move very far away. Mm -hmm. Don't the neighbors also have a swim spa? Yeah. I don't know. On the other side of that wall. Do they? Okay. Yeah. I must not have seen that. A few months ago, <laughs> yes. they okay. did that, or a year ago, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And their house is, you know, a a further to the right. You can, there's a, 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 a zoomed out. So is that like a fence on that side of it? Yeah. Of the because I see walls on three yep. sides. Yeah, left hand side fence for access, and also that abuts the plantings, mm. right? And those plantings, I think we went over in the last application when we talked about the addition to and have some renderings in the record of that. They're tall or screening, sort of a mix of evergreen and deciduous plantings yeah. to help that uh, throughout the year. Okay, that's the only comment I have. Thank you, um, Mr. Scott. Can you go to the other rendering, please? The next one. Just yeah, just some questions. Uh, the the column details are interesting. Uh, whether kind of this kind of profile, I'm assuming steel, uh, or are they a wrap that goes over a steel pipe? 
it's the uh, composition of those right now is a stone with a stone. with hollowed out with a round three inch okay. steel pipe column in it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and and do those those wrap up and down around each of the openings, right? Correct. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, the one con question I had is, how do you see that? Just do you see that just hitting the pool deck, just sitting flush? There's no, I don't want, necessarily want a base, but just how that would actually sit on the, mm -hmm. the deck. You want that modern, clean kind of yeah look as yeah. it's being represented here. Yeah, I think that the uh, paving stones, the blue stone would be cut out around it so that that column engages in it. It's all on a, uh, uh, and then waterproof, but it's on a uh, slab underneath there for just the base of the pool house and also the, the deck. I mean, I think that that is a great question and it was a call that we had today, actually. Um, just uh, how that starts to meet. I think what we're trying to achieve is just the cleanest possible you know, connection there without deviation one way or the other. So if it sits on it or is engaged in it, certainly sitting on it would be better long-term. Um, and I think with the materials we're talking about, we could probably achieve that. Yeah, I think that, because I think if you had any sort of you know, pull off of, off the deck, you're going to expose the steel, then you have longevity, so then you have a concrete raise, and then it starts to fall apart, right? right. So I think that detail is going to be very important to yeah. maintain this look. Because I think that that detail of the column is, is quite unique and how it wraps around. Yeah. Um, two more questions. The green, the, the, the live roof that you're showing, is that a, a trace style system or is that an actual built up live green uh, roof? The planting there is, it's a, it's a trained, I think they're thinking that it trains up a bit, but it's sort of from the back. It's not like meant to be a planter with stuff in it. They're sort of romanticizing this uh, as a rendering for the owners a little bit, but uh, it's not a green roof. Not right? a green, no green roof. Right. Okay. Because okay. I think that's that's kind of important because from the street side, that's the kind of element that you start to see yeah. through the, the landscaping. Yeah. Uh, as a green roof, it starts to kind of blend into that landscaping. But if it's, it's just going to be a, yeah. maybe a gunner. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then it, actually that's a question as a flat roof, are you just doing internal drain or are you just sheeting it off to the one side or gutters? You know, in the sections that we provided, it's a it is, yes. membrane low slope roof, okay. um, dark in this case, um, that slopes back towards the street. Uh, so that rendering that we submitted was basically street view walking down the street, looking sort of just because the sidewalk comes up there is an existing sort of bump up that gets planted and that's where that fence is. So that's um, the intent is just a very low slope membrane roof. No, again, and I appreciate the, the minimizing that because again, it's not the front. I've always considered this the backyard of that, this property because it is, um, but it unfortunately it comes across as front. So having this, the back of that pool house now being the thing that's on against the street yeah. uh, is not desirable, but if it's well screened and maintained, then I think that's, that's fine. Um, and then just out of curiosity, the, the main block under the flat roof of the, basically what I'm assuming is the restroom, yep. uh, is kind of a rounded stucco, mm -hmm. panelized, almost grooved stucco. Um, obviously, you're looking to match, based on what I saw the notes, match the existing stucco um, texture of the, the existing Correct. house. Yep. Were you, did you consider pulling in any other subtle details of that, of the house? I know. Now, uh, the other side of the pool deck, there are columns and other little mm -hmm. details that are articulated in the house. Yep. Obviously, it looks like you went to a very modern yeah. interpretation of that, which I think works well with the pool design, but it, in a way is a little disconnected from the house. Um, I don't think it's too far where I would say you have to put columns in or change it, but I, I think just as this continues to move forward, you know, as those details uh, move forward and get finalized, um, you know, little subtle things that can be brought in to kind of mm -hmm. tie that, you know, yeah. and that could be a handle on the door or yeah. just a trim. I think the column wrap does that. And I think that's enough for me to kind of yeah. in this, but I think, you know, just looking at that, I'm, I don't want to change it too much because I think it's very appropriate with the scale and uh, from the street and the, the pool deck. Um, the, the intent, I guess, for that is material match, but sort of mute it because it is a pavilion and meant to be more open. So we're not building up this mass in, in that yard. Um, it, it, that's kind of, I guess, our thinking in some ways. And I would agree with that. I think yeah. that's, you, you wouldn't want a structure heavy and weighted like that in this location, in this spot. So I totally agree with that. 
I, I, unfortunately, the slide isn't modeled in the rendering. Yeah, uh, and I did see a photo of the packet, which is just fabulous. Uh, you know, if that was more visible, maybe that's the most visible thing that you'll see from the street. Um, but it's it's pretty wild. So no, I, I don't have any other comments. Thank you, uh, Thank Mr. You. Hellman. Uh, I have the same issue, is it, it or not issue, but just a question on the school or the the, the spa equipment location. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything that shows that that shows its elevation? Oh, I could not find, it. and maybe it's in here, but my my iPad's acting up here a little bit, yeah, okay. so I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how tall it is, yeah. um, and since that's the biggest building piece closest to a neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I think we should yep. understand what we're approving. I think on in the landscape design plans, there is a if we could show it on the mic. My thing isn't working here, yep. so I can't get so anything. These, yeah, the solid portion of that wall is shown four foot eight off of the deck. Um, as far as that, and I think that there's also a wood fence detail in the landscape drawings. Yeah, it calls um, it out. Yeah, landscape drawing that has that wood fence, which is a four foot tall wood fence, certainly uh, tall enough to conceal and cover any of the equipment height, which is, you know, 36 to 42. So what is what I'm seeing on the landscape plan is it says screened and fenced pool spa and equipment location. That's an open. Mm -hmm. There's a wood fence on the uh, west and half of the south side. Okay. And then the uh, east and north side are a continuation of the pool wall, which is that right. four eight. Second. And then how? What? But how tall is it? I mean, there's no, there's no. Right. The wood fence is four feet. It, there's a detail in the landscape drawing that calls out the elevation and section of both of those wall okay. types. So it's four feet tall. Four feet on the wood side. Four foot eight on the other side. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any other comments, Mr. Helm? Uh, no, I think it's uh, it's a nice design. All right, I guess that leaves me. Um, I would say that um, you've outdone Philip Johnson in some ways. I mean, you didn't, you don't have the glass walls in the bed, you know, right there, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. But um, the green at the edge of the roof really does it for me. I think if that green wasn't there, mm -hmm. that this would feel very stark. Yep. Um, and I think actually would conflict with the house. So I think it's important that that green edge, whether it's wisteria or however you're looking at this, like a pergola trellis system, I think it's critical to the to the design and the softness of this building. I love that you have these piers, you know, sort of, I guess the green just makes it for me because of the modernist, you know, take that you're that you that you have here. Um, I think of the Florence train station, you know, designed mm -hmm. by Michelucci. I think of Philip Johnson. I think of, you know, a number of other things, but that green is important. I also, in the renderings make it look like they're, that this is taller than it really is, but you're saying it's eight feet from yeah. the pool deck to the underside of the ceiling? Yeah. So the, I mean, renderings are funny, right? But the rendering is made off of a model that is represented in our sections. So yeah, it's a eight footer. Yeah. Um, and if there's any issue with the landscaping, the, if there's anything, uh, if there's any issue on the Clifton side that, that ice storms or whatever that that would be replaced, the owners would replace that all for the keep the screening. It's all going to be evergreen screening on the Clifton side. Yeah, I think that those plantings are called out, but yes, it's mostly evergreens for just you know through privacy throughout. I I think we call them out now. I don't know what species they are because it's I'm not very good at that. But um, the intent is sort of having that as a uh, privacy barrier also built up sort of green space in between the lawn and the yard. Um, if in the landscape plan, I think it's called out if we want to yeah. identify them. It's no, it's not. In, it's, I, I understand what you're what you're looking for here. The gutter is on the Clifton side of the pavilion, correct? Correct. Yeah. And I don't have any further comments. Uh, anybody, the, only, the only additional thing, this would be a great plan to go to the public, to Tree and Public Gardens Commission for the review of the yep. landscape plan. Yeah. Because uh, I think they'll enjoy seeing it as well. So it's a. The landscape architect has been um, working with the uh, city review. I don't know. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I didn't hear any conditions that were asked. So I think we just go right to the finding of fact. 
Oh, is there anybody in, is there anybody present withstanding that would like to speak to this project? Seeing none. This project is for B. This is a recommendation to BZAP, correct? So, um, and this will go to the Tree and Public Garden Commission. That'll be a condition of the application. Um, Ms. Rose, can we have the findings of fact and recommendation to BZAP? <clears throat> Decision of the board, the architecture review board finds an application number BZAP 21 47 for property located at 81 North Drexel. Recommends design approval to the board of zoning and planning subject to zoning approval as the, they find the whole structure is architecture compatible with the principal structure. It should be approved for recommendation with the condition that the landscaping is reviewed and approved by the Tree and Public Garden Commission. You've heard the findings of facts and the decision of the board. Do you have any, do you, do you understand that these, these conditions, uh, these findings of fact, that they will become part of the application? <laughs> yes, I do. May I have a motion? So move. Second. Second. Ms. Rose, will you call the roll? Mr. Strasser? Yes. Ms. Crossy? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Our next application. Uh, let's see. Can you pull that up so I can see it on there? There. Thank you. As application ARB 2172, the address is 492 South Drexel. The app applicant is Amy Lauerhaus. The owner, Evan and Dana Williams. The applicant is requesting architecture review and approval and a certificate of appropriateness to for the replacement of a slate roof with asphalt shingles. The applicant could come forward, please. You uh, state your names and be sworn in, please. Evan Williams. And Glenn Williams. Do you strongly swear or from the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Boker, do we have staff comments? Yes. Um, I do have some staff comments. This applicant um, called, well, we had a conversation via our. Uh, Yes. So Amy, Amy uploaded that during the last couple, okay. I think earlier this week.
evaluation of whether we cost is fair is appropriate because um, I am no state expert, except that I've been to home for four years. And the pictures of Greek and telling me that there don't appear to be a lot of tracks. Um, they title <laughs> it seems pretty uniformly in line and look to be the shape of high lines about what kind of slope it is. So that you talked about that. Um, so I would just ask the board to in a testimony read the material, but as staff, I would also like to note that there's been a vintage of, of, of repair quote as well. Because you can get on you know these repair programs where every couple of years you just replace the broken for a cost that is minimal compared to replacing the entire pavement of asphalt. And then it lasts a long That's my personal experience. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah, I mean, so just to be clear, we didn't want to have to replace the slab. <laughs> we liked it. We've been here since 2014. Then um, the addition went up, and Glenn will be able to talk about the specific details. But as the addition was going up and connecting to the back of the house where there is slate, um, it was clear that there were severe issues with the slate that was on the home in that location. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to you to talk about technically what that is. Um, of course, it, it, you're going to reiterate, I, I guess, what's in sure. the report here too. But... So I am Evans Builder. We are Kiwi Home Renovations. Um, we are no relation, just to clarify. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, if you wanted to go back to the picture of the roof, I'll give you the two minute backstory. Um, the oh, back, please. I'm sorry. Uh, have you been sworn in? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the bottom left picture. So the bottom left of the picture is showing the uh, original addition that was on the house. It had an EPTM membrane and it was butting up to the underside of the lean-to, I would call it a lean-to dormer. Um, please, if you don't understand my expressions, I'll put on my immigrant hat and say I'm from New Zealand and <laughs> what we call things and what cool things are here are quite different sometimes. So please. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm fine either way, but whatever's easiest. Um, when we pulled the old addition off the house, we realized that the existing EPDM membrane had been leaking. It had damaged a whole lot of rafters. The whole thing was completely rotten. We threw it all away. We were putting a new, we were putting a new addition on the back of the house and gabling back into the existing roof running this way. We were going to leave part of the um, lean-to dormer up, um, but when we got into it we realized it had been leaking and the whole structure was rotten the chimney on the right had come down or has come down as part of the um, construction process and by the time we got our gable in and started working on the slate we realized that the slate was done um, at that point was when I applied for the original uh, change from asphalt to uh, from slate to asphalt However, um, that's when we got involved with, we reached out to Precision Slate and Durable Slate. Both were, could not give us anything in the time frame requested. And we ended up with Legacy Restoration, who was also a slate contractor. He has given us two reports um, in answering to your question, Karen, about the maintenance program. He came and looked at the roof and determined that the roof is beyond maintenance. I bought some just representative pieces of um, slate you touch it, it just dis disintegrates in your hands. It's just done um, the life of it. Uh, I, this is any given piece, I'm happy to show you or anybody wants to look at anything. Um, where it's been under cover, it's reasonably solid. Where it's been exposed, it delaminates. You touch one, it dies, you go to the next one. You're 10 in before you get to anything solid. It's just done its time. And that is reflected in his report. Um, he believed that um, his, well, straight out of his paragraph, that's not the letter, that's the original one. There's two others from Legacy Re Restoration that were submitted. Yes, the roof evaluation. And you'll see in his report that he says that you can replace few and carry on, but that is not effective in this particular situation. Um, he felt that there was no way we could do a maintenance program based on where we are. The front valleys are rotten. 
we've got some issues with underlayment that is soft. Um, and literally, as soon as you touch one shingle, you're into 10, 15, 20 and going from there. His recommendation is full replacement um, in either slate or asphalt. Um, and he gave us a slate replacement cost, which is effectively $38,000 for front and back. Um, the question I wanted to note on the front and back of the house. So going back to the picture we were looking at originally, the back plane of the house, you cannot see from anywhere this plane of the house, you cannot see this. You can't see it from the specs up to the alleyway. You can't see it from there. On Brighton Road, you can see the top right-hand corner about a foot and a half square of the top right-hand peak. You can't see anything else. Um, so when I originally started talking with Karen, um, I made the suggestion, can we asphalt the back of the house? Um, at that point, I had to get us waterproof. So we took that option on the proviso that whatever the board recommends is what we will do. So at the moment, the back plane of the house is fully asphalted and completely waterproof. The front of the house is still the original slate. Um, and the option comes back to then what's acceptable and what's not in re reform of placement. And that's back to Evan. Thank you. Is there anybody in the audience that has uh, standing that would like to speak about this project? Seeing none, I think we could have uh, board comments. Mr. Hellman? Maybe I've been sitting here too long. <laughs> Mr. Hellman, could you turn on your, turn on your microphone, please? Um, again, the request is to do to what? Replace the shingled roof with asphalt. The addition was already the approved. entire roof, or just the entire the roof. entire roof. Yes. Okay. And partially, the the roofer's assessment identifies how poor of shape that is in, right. including the underlayment under the slates itself. Right. And what's the what's the year of construction of the house? Nineteen twenty three. And the roofer's report calls the slate out as a Pennsylvania black slate with a service life of between eighty and hundred years. Right. Okay. I have no questions, Mr. Scott. Um, I don't. What uh, what is the replacement asphalt being proposed? Uh, a state gray. What what is the Try manufacturer? Dimension. Sorry, I didn't hear that. But the, the asphalt shingle that's being proposed is what is the manufacturer name of it? A state gray dimensional asphalt. Dimensional asphalt. Uh, you know, we we have seen uh, a few slate roof replacements, uh, Pennsylvania slate um, at this time frame. Who, based on what I've seen um, is, is having issues in, in the neighborhood. So, um, you know, obviously we would love to see a full replacement of, of the slate, um, but that's, you know, that's not a standard installation cost that you see today. I would love that too. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't, you know, I think the uniformity of the, the slate, it, it's held up quite well. Uh, looking at the photographs they they, they look great except for some certain conditions, but again, that's because they're not moving yet. Correct. As they start to continue to fail, um, and you, in this may without touching it, you, you, this may have lasted until the substructure totally failed for you know ten more years. Um, but since now you're in it, it's you have a problem. So I, I don't have any other questions. I think you've presented, um, you know, the paperwork you know we needed to kind of what we require to kind of see and evaluate this. I don't sure any other questions for me. Thank you, Ms. Strasser. Um, no, we went through the addition and a state gray was chosen. Um, so we were going to carry through with the addition and carry on with the, with the whole roof in the one stall. I did consult uh, Amy Lauer house about it and we ended up selecting the same shingle she used on her house okay. for what it's worth. Ms. Trosser, or I mean, Ms. Krosky. Oh, yes. All new valleys, all new flashings. And all new gutters. 
trying to do the fair, the fair. Anything that needs yeah. replacing, now's the time to get it done. Yeah. So yes. Um, okay. And the porch gets a new EPDM roof as well. Thank you. So I was looking at the application package and to me there's there's things missing. We I, I didn't receive in the package the pricing for the slate replacement, nor did I receive the pricing for an asphalt replacement. So these are that was an important part of the packet that I think uh, what the, the slate replacement is in this letter. It's in the second part of that letter. There's two pieces of it. You have one, there's another. This this is the document that you need. Um, yes. I, I have a copy yes, please. Hey, I got this, but I only got the first page. Yeah. Oh no, two, I didn't get there's this. There's two separate we documents. Didn't, yeah, there we didn't get this. Roof evaluation, and then there was a roof replacement quote. So, what legacy restoration was provided assessment, which I think is the Yes, that's what we got. And then, uh, thinking about our house also after this, what did we do today to it was about a week later we put it in. Yeah. Thank you. Legacy didn't give me the, when we requested all the information and we were rushed for time, Legacy didn't do what I'd asked them to do. So I went back to them and said, please, I need this. Um, the asphalt replacement cost, I'm sorry, we did not submit that. That is uh, $5,500 was the quoted price. So the documentation that we normally request, as Ms. Bokor had stated earlier, uh, the estimates as you, as you, um, had sent us a, a, a history, whether it's a page or a paragraph on the uh, history of the roof maintenance, which it appears there hasn't been much on the slate. Like I've, I've been there for four years and we have had uh, some years as much as a $700 repair, other right. years as low as 400, it's, right. it's just range. But there's no documentation prior to your ownership? Uh, no, no, none was available. Right. Um, a written statement of the architectural importance of the existing slate roof. Um, and that uh, applicants are to work with design consultant to determine the additional level of documentation necessary for consideration of a slate roof removal, which I think you've done. So my sense on this is uh, based on everything I've seen that, you know, there's a couple of things missing in the application. I understand uh, your, your circumstances, but I think we've learned the hard way that doing asphalt shingles uh, on Drexel is a huge mistake for the houses that have existing slate. And I can't vote for the, the removal of more slate on Drexel. And this slate seems to be in fairly good condition except for valleys. And mostly it's your underlayment and your flashings that are causing this problem. And the slate obviously deteriorating um, is an issue, but is there any way to compromise and have the front of the house done in slate and switch to the asphalt on the back and do the ridge as, an, as, as a uh, slate cap? Can I answer your question based on the report? The roofing report very clearly states that the slate is the problem, not only the flashings and the underlayment. Understood, but is it the slate in total or the slate in particular areas? Slate in total. It doesn't say that. So from the photographs, it seems from the observation of the other board, other board members that the slate in a lot of the body of the roof um, is actually in pretty good condition. Sorry, it says it's, I thought it said it specifically. Uh, many times we recommend an option of performing what is called a pickup and relay of the existing roof, da, 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 da. This process allows us to keep initial roof material costs down because of all that is placed as the underlayment and the existing slates would be resecured with the new roofing nails. That is not recommended for this roof. These slates are not in proper condition to be salvaged. It is our recommendation to have this re roof replaced with new roofing material. Right. Thank you. I think I think that there could be different interpretations as to how much of that is the case. But regardless, um, slate is incredibly important for Bexley and especially on Drexel. And the replacement cost of thirty-eight thousand to last you a hundred years. You're going to replace your asphalt. Uh, five times over that same period, at least, for a total cost of over fifty thousand. So, are you building? Are you are you you know putting the money in now to to build a permanent roof for you and you know your 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 gener generations to come, or are you? Well, the the, the asphalt was fifty five hundred. Yes. 
So, so five replacements of that, with all due respect, is still less money. And it's also spread out over a hundred years instead of a one-time purchase. 20, 20. There are some that have been, that, we, that we've had to. Um, so we know that, a, that, that shingles are roughly a 20 year lifespan. It says 50 on, on but we know that they, they don't go much longer than that. Right. So you're five times 550 over uh, 100 years and you're at 27,500. So you're, you're less, but. And it's that cash flow spread out. Over. Sure, I understand. But this is Bexley and, and this is Drexel Avenue. And I, I just, I can't see that there's, that there has not been a, an argument for economic hardship in this, in this particular case. And I would, I would ask to compromise that you put the slate, a new slate on the front and that you can put your asphalt on the back. Would that be acceptable? Is it, is it constructible first off? It's, yes, it's totally constructible. There's a, there's a reasonable argument that we are doing almost a half million dollar update on the home and that by what you're asking, two thirds of the house will be asphalt and the front third will be slate. Is it reasonable to ask that the whole house could be the same material? I, I see that it could be converse, um, particularly when I look at two houses this way and two houses this way that are all asphalt. I understand. Now, yeah. Yeah. And this has been a problem, you know, that we've been dealing with a uh, slate that has not been maintained and there's economic hardship or there's a leaking roof and somebody needs to get it repaired right away and they can't afford the slate. There's all kinds of issues here. Sure. But, but what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in this documentation is why I'm asking that compromise. And we've learned that uh, asphalt shingles facing Drexel, which is the most public street really in Bexley for residential architecture. Okay, we've learned to our detriment that we reduce the quality of the streetscape. And so it's the streetscape is a public viewing corridor. And it's also reflective of who we are as Bexley. And so I'm asking for that compromise. That I have to defer to Evan for that. Procedurally, I mean, if I say no to the compromise, is that what happens? Like, if you, then we go to a, a straight vote, and you you would then be asking to the board members to just vote for the whole replacement, and you would be hopefully counting on a majority for that to happen yeah, to, to, like to get I'm your approval. I'm trying to figure out what my out is if, if that doesn't happen, right? I mean, like, is it? I'm back here next month. What is the time frame if? If we have to replace the front roof, is there a time frame given to do that with? Uh, Ms. Rose? I don't understand the is there a time frame for the replacement if they, they get the front, a... The front roof needs replacing now. If, if the $26,000 right. expenditure is out of our reach, is there a time frame that we have to comply with from the city of Bexley or it's all up to us? The roof's leaking, it's got to be fixed right about the right side. Are you looking to repair it? Repair? Well, my my professional roof has said it's it's unrepairable. It's it's got to all come off, and we'll have something else to want. So for us, it's a a chunk of a change expenditure. But again, I am the contractor. I am not the homeowner that's yeah. got to spend twenty. I'm fearful. I've got a professional roofer who's told me that it's it's bad. It's at its end of life. It needs to be replaced, and there's a twenty six thousand dollar cost to replace the roof, and that's. I, that's a lot of money. And we've already had significant costs on the operation. <laughs> the cost of replacing this in front is how much? $26,050. For slate on the front of the house. Correct. Front of the uh, table, valleys, flashing, everything. And the section of the house in the back where the slate was removed and the shingles were replaced, that was not approved by the ARP. Is that right? Correct. Correct. We it had was... a verbal approval to do it. With the outcome based on what you decide. Understanding there are some risks. Now I can look at one. But and I, say, I needed to have a waterproof roof. I had no no way of doing it. So. Yeah, I'm I'm concerned by it, and I understand the issues. We've talked about this, but it it's like 
we that require Slater, we don't. I mean, you know, this this is a little, uh, this is kind of a, a, a bit awkward in my mind because the material wears out. It just simply wears out, and then when it wears out, it takes the uh, it takes part of the framing with it. So uh, we've got to do we've got to be fair here with this. And while I understand the civic part of the street, we can turn right around and put solar panels on it too, and then you know we don't the slate doesn't matter anyway. Um, so I'm a little uncomfortable with with requiring that, um, and at that price differential, uh, it, and we've been uneven. I mean, we've other folks have had their asphalt shingles and we're just fine and other people we do this so i i don't know whether we need to fix policy on this or something but uh these one-offs i'm not i'm not i'm just not comfortable with it does anyone have a sense for the legitimacy and reputation of the company that provided the report saying that it was not repairable because it's not a company that i'm familiar with i'm not even it's not a company. I, I rang multiple companies and nobody could get to it in our time frame. So I went back to recommendations for companies and legacy was recommended to us. That's how I ended up with these people. I mean, I think Durable told you it was going to be many months before they'd even give you yeah. the time to death. And they, they weren't interested in writing a report and it was like, guys, be slight. What are you talking and about? Right? To be clear, I've, I've not heard anything good about Pennsylvania Black. Yeah. Yes. Or the, the kind of show itself. The reason that I had started out, I said, you know, my one big point in my class is where this curiosity about the hair, that in the picture that I pull up the one, it certainly looks like hair has been taken care of. I don't know if that was your wife or not, but it does look nice. I know the that you can tell or repair. So I didn't know if that was a possibility to be just on a repair for a replacement program. But like my caveat to all that is why not play it. And so, and we did approach the slate company saying I need both options please. I need a repair plan if that is possible or I need a full replacement if that is not possible. And their outcome was it is not possible or it's not recommended that the slate is at the end of its life and it needs to be redone completely. So you'd like us to proceed with the vote, as stated in the application, and not not to entertain the condi the condition that I am proposing. Yes. Okay. Um, any further comments from the board? Ms. Rose, will you state the findings of fact and um, decision of the board? The board finds that it's significant that a permit should be issued to allow the existing slate to be replaced with asphalt shingles due to the material condition of the existing black slate and damage to the structure. You've heard the findings of fact and decision of the board. You understand that these conditions will be made part of the application for the entire roof because the initial request was for the just for the main house right just the main gable yes the original the original sorry, the addition is all covered under the existing permit saying that we can use the estate grace so it's for the main it's for the main block of the house the existing yeah, existing roof of the house correct the two-story portion yes yes you've heard the findings of fact and you understand that these will be Yes. Made part of the application. May I have a motion? So move. Second. Second. Ms. Rose, will you call the roll? Mr. Hellman? Yes. Ms. Frosty? Yes. Ms. Rosser? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Mr. Hyder? No. Thank you. Your application has been approved. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Our next application. If I get these right. <laughs> is uh, ARB 2173. The address is 2453 Seneca Park. The applicant is Suncraft Corporation, Inc. The owners are Sandra and Adam Solove. Solove, sorry. 
The applicant is requesting architecture review and approval uh, and a certificate of appropriateness for the addition of a rear porch. The applicant is here. Would you please state your name and be sworn in? Uh, <clears throat> James Knox with Suncraft. Would you please be sworn in? Do you sign my swear from the testimony you're about to give this evening is the truth? Yes. Ms. Booker, do you have comments? I will not about the plans. Oh, I think I just did that twice. Okay. Um, this application is for an addition to an addition. That that's probably the best way to put it. Um, I have a few concerns. I I just want to understand a little bit more of how the two, how this connects to what is currently an existing mudroom addition. Is that correct? Here's a picture of what is now existing. And my understanding is that this will be just a further extension from it. And I'm curious how that ties into the existing roof line, how it deals with the door that's currently above that just stays there. I have, a, I have some concerns about how the two come together. Um, it kind of looks like it just abuts it and doesn't tie in really smoothly. So I would like to have those details more worked out. Happy to work, work with the applicant, but um, wanted to hear some board comments initially too. Um, some concerns about the columns, how they're um, placed. I think the applicant can be sworn in. Yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry, then yep. board comments. Please proceed. Do you have any comments to add? Uh, it's, as far as the uh, roof goes, it has an existing uh, rubber roof. We're going to just extend that roof line with the same slope to, uh, what is it, six feet, uh, six feet further out uh, as an open porch uh, over where there's an existing uh, enclosed porch. Um, it's basically the substructure is basically built um, like uh, deck framing. Uh, it's got a beam underneath of the uh, posts. There's, there's uh, posts out on each corner. They'll, the, the weight of, uh, of the two columns is just transferred straight to the foundation. Thank you. Any comments from the board? I'll just open it up. Yes, I'd like to start. Um, so I'm looking at your elevations. Uh, specifically, well, all of them. Um, your column detail, I think, um, how it at the, at the roof where it's hitting the header trim uh, isn't really architecturally accurate. Um, I think, I, and I think you know what to do. So I think I'm just going to make a list, and you can work with them. Right? So I think in the big, in the end, it's not a big deal. We just you know make a, sure the details are correct. I think the the handrail. Uh, since we have one on the steps, this needs to also be um, make sure make sure it's obviously we don't do code compliance, but I think we need to make sure it's, it's code. Um, the, the treated pine vertical skirting uh, for the, the kind of porch wrap. I think it's nice that you're doing a porch wrap. I don't know if if that treated pine will make it more than a year. Uh, so how that sits at grade and you know how that's detailed, I think is going to be important because I don't think it'll hold up. Um, like what's backer? What's the backer behind that? And you know how that meets and it's treated, but how does it actually meet grade? And and then of course, what's the finish? Are you planning on painting it or leaving it just the treated plywood? Um, I believe it was intended to be uh, um, just uh, leave it as treated, but uh, we can certainly. I, I just I, I worry longevity, right? I think it's going to be. Yeah, it's not going to hold up in the, in the elements very well, uh, even with its treatment. Yeah, another uh, one of our uh, finishes we use is uh, cement board uh, pipe. That would be and more appropriate. Being painted. The, the plywood will wick water even if it's treated. And if it's actually touching the ground, it needs to be uh, ground contact treated, which is a different type of treatment. So mm -hmm. um, just be mindful of that. that uh, I think that's going to be important. So that finished material, if it's cement board, would be great. It's a recommendation. But also then how that comes and meets the, the grade. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Sure, I'll go. Uh, I agree with that. I agree that that skirt board, something different needs to happen there. Uh, the fiber cement, I 
go that route. Um, I noticed it says that existing structure is going to stay as is, um, but it looks like it has quite a bit of stuff going on with the, um, like if you go to this photo, please. It, I don't know, there, there's some, I've got concerns about, you know, what's going on with that. Uh, I'm, what I'm assuming is, is that like wood siding of some sort? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, so the paint's chipping, it looks, uh, is that brick down below it? It's hard to tell next to the stair or is that just like- uh, There is, yes, there is some brick there on the corner. Is that brick? Oh, so it's wood down there too? So you're going to cover that up and, you know, you've got some issues going on with like, you know, maintenance and is that stuff like rotted? Is it not? I think that needs to be addressed. I mean, it would behoove the owners to consider that. Um, the columns out front are nice columns. And I don't know if there's a way that they can be replicated for the back to at least tie, um, tie in what's happening there with you know, the new porch that they want to put on the back. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another consideration. And I think that's where I'll stop. Anyone else? I just repeat the comment on the columns and to the extent you can integrate some of that same proportion to that to the back, I think that would um, serve me well. Okay, are you looking at uh, some sort of a, um, not necessarily plastic, but a, some sort of a round column wrap for yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you it, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. It could be fiberglass. It could be fiberglass. There's lots of different materials. I think the the issue is is the proportions and the detailing. Okay. Yes, we could certainly we could certainly change yeah. that. It would be more cohesive to, if you yeah. consider doing something similar to the front yeah. and mm -hmm. the back. Yeah, because yeah. the front because the front also has a flat roof as well, and right. yeah, very set. We're going to be trying emulate the uh, mm -hmm. profile of that as closely as we can. So I, I think that the, these comments are all helpful. I would just I would just add that, you know, our, the design consultant will work out all these details with you. Uh, it's, it'll be mentioned in the findings of fact. Um, I would just add that I think that this, this should be painted and not just left as treated. Um, and mainly because of the other details that we're trying to you know, tie well, in. Yes. The, well, the homeowner will be painting uh, all the new surfaces yeah. of the of the porch, right? And I'm, I'm I would assume that they would also address the yeah. uh, back porch while they have the paintbrush in their hand to yeah. do the the siding on the back on yeah. the back wall there. I I will state that um, when you set those columns, the beam system is probably going to have to be inboard of mm -hmm. the out edge of the existing addition. Yeah, so that the beam works correctly with the columns and Ms. Bokor can help, you know, uh, work with you on that. That's all I have. Any other comments? Yeah, as long as you're comfortable that there's sufficient slope on that roof, that it doesn't, you don't have a slope going to a flat and in, in over the uh, new addition. Right. There's yeah. enough it's, so that you can. Yeah, we'll, and then we will you, extend it there. Uh, and do you have a sense of, I'm, I'm not sure it was on my computer died, uh, what the height is coming off the back of the house and what that taper is, what, what's I, your I height in the back? Uh, I want to say it's uh, somewhere in the uh, two to three inch range. In the in, back? In, in, from the house to the front, which is. Three inch, three inches here to go into zero. Right. And then how do you, at what do you. six feet. That's and then how do you feet. handle the slope from the new addition outward? Uh, it, would, it would just continue. We'll just maintain. Well, that. but it can't. It's continuing flat, or is it continuing the slope? It continues it's continuing the slope. The slope. It's going to then drop down. Yes. So that's going to be a different. And and do we have a side profile of that it, again, real quick, Karen? What's the the, the side profile? Yeah, there is. It's the elevations. They show the. It shows the slope. The on the drawing. The, the I think by, by code you have to maintain a quarter inch per foot. Yes. So as long as you're as long as he's meeting code of a quarter inch per foot, he can meet the warranty okay. of the memory. Okay. It'll be all in the material documentation. And you're, the existing the existing membrane staying on, and you're just extending it, so you're going to seam it, or are you yes. putting on a new membrane? Uh, it it'll be uh, at the recommendation of our roof our roofing uh, installer. Okay. Whether I mean, with it only being 
um, six feet and uh, what is that? Uh, 10, 10 feet. Oh, yeah, six, roughly six foot by 14. He might just recommend just re redoing the whole thing while I, he's I, there. I, yeah, I would recommend that, but I don't know how we make that as a board here. But because of compatibility with product and how long it's been up and EV right. light. Yes. It, and it, the, the last point would be uh, in, in terms of we're talking about the column, but there has to be some way to get the drain spout down from the gutter. And would that be on a round column? Is that, are we okay with that? Or where does that downspout go? Uh, it is right now, it is at the uh, uh, corner, uh, the outside corner of the. Uh, yeah, and it could yeah, remain there. The window. Yeah. 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 Right where that cursor is? Yes, yes, yes. right there. That, 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 would be a, that would be a good location. The wrap around. You don't have a problem with the round. Be able to round that new, new okay. round. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, is there anyone in the audience with standing that would like to speak on this project? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Rose, can we have the findings of fact, please? You've heard the findings of fact and decision of the board. Do you understand those will be are you you understand those findings of fact? Yes. It'll become part of the application. Yes, sir. Uh, any conditions or other modifications from the board? Hearing none, um, may I have a motion? Moved. Second. Ms. Rose, can we have the roll? Mr. Scott? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Your application has been approved. Thank you for your patience tonight. Oh, thank you. Our uh, next and last application is a BZAP 2144. Uh, the address is 280 South Columbia. The applicant is Corey Tishkoff. The owner is Corey Tishkoff. The applicant is requesting a recommendation to the Board of Zoning and Planning for architecture review and approval and a certificate of appropriateness for a pool and a pool house in the side yard. The applicant is here. Um, would you kindly be sworn in? Greg Tishkoff. I do. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, before we start, I'd just like to thank Mr. Tishkoff for being patient oh, yes. and staying here all night. Found it really. It was all good. very interesting. You guys earned your, you guys earned your money tonight. <laughs> all right. So thank you. If we could have staff comments, please. Well, a lot of that, a lot of that's attributable to this board. So Karen and, you know, all of you were in the recommendations you made. Uh, we were frustrated at the time, but um, it, it turned out well. So I, I, we all appreciate it. Well, it didn't show That's so that that's 13 feet. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, if you're actually, uh, if you're, if you're saying the elevation, as far as the height of the pool house, I don't know if I'm. Oh, I just meant drawings. Like 
straight gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I just didn't know if to, from a dimension standpoint if, if you were missing that part of it, but um, yeah. okay. We're great. Gotcha. Um, the, I think that everything about this project that you're speaking of, you know, the design guidelines, well, design guidelines that we have, and the ones that we're working on. Um, I guess I would just question whether the board would like to see or be part of the process between now and ASAP to get you going on this. Um, the details of the information. Um, there's just these renderings are great, but um, there are any other should have. Should have. Yeah. Um, we so didn't. I don't yeah. Know how the board wants to want to comment on the design? I, you know, I think in consistency, you know, we're nothing if we're not consistent. So, um, is to. I don't think we can approve drawings that aren't there. So uh, we either have to have the draw remanded to you to say what we're seeing here is in a set of drawings dimensional that you're then comfortable with uh, and or it has to come back. But I, I we, we can't give a full throated approval uh, based on computer well, drawings. So to be clear, what I'm asking is, because I wasn't clear, we could do a recommendation to do that with the request that it come back here for final design. That'd be fine. That 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 oh, oh, no, it's not it's not it's not it's not it's not Unless he came to the special session right. in December. You're, you're, already, you're already meeting December. <laughs> this oh, Let's do it. <laughs> come on. We won't be long winded. And Kathy, it'll take, you're, you're sure that I know Cor Corey sent you a few different, that she didn't send any any elevations in any of the different things she sent. I think we should wait until this, this will all change to elevations. You know it will. Let me, did they submit a permit first and then we determined that because of the location it had to go? Possibly. Yeah, I know she sent you and she knows. Side, they need code. These were on the north side. So you're saying it would be Well, I'm not prepared to look at the computer model unless we have elevations with real details. Yeah, I'm just, just checking to see if they actually were in there. Oh. That's all. <laughs> Because the BZAP meeting is which day? December second. And it would be it would come back to us on December 9th, and we would have a quick review on December 9th. That would be first on the agenda. And you get to go first. First is that acceptable? Sure. Yeah. As far as we can get them to provide that by then. Before the drawings, yeah. Well, you've you've got almost a month, so for us. So I, I would like to give you some at least some comment because you're if you don't have them you're gonna have to put them together. I think massing in style of the, the pool house I think is on the right track. I think the details are something we're gonna need to see and review. Uh, and and I, we can go through a list of those details, but I think you can probably work with Karen to kind of work through that because she knows. But I think you know looking at this the proportions and you know what you're looking at kind of as the design elements I think is probably fairly appropriate. So. Um, yeah, right. But you know, obviously, spe pay special attention to how the columns the columns are working, the basis of those columns, uh, and those details that the eaves and the cupola being centered on the TV or not on the TV is a big one. But uh, those types of things, I, I don't want to get into the specifics tonight because we're no, going to come I, back. But I, I'm I, not sure you want to do those double columns. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary either. But that's why does it going to be take up space that are yeah, that's yeah. I mean, great. Thank you. And I think just making sure we have a nice, strong, clear presentation. Right. With with elevation and rotated. elevations and plans. So, well, the reason I went and left my comp today and I didn't start on is that it's a recommendation. So you can at least get some feedback for your zoning, and we'll get you back on the special meeting. Okay. And that's you know, great. As long as it goes well. And as far as the side yard issue that's i mean is that something that just has to that's these oh, okay all right okay okay do we need to vote on that recommendation yes. we are voting on it 
Yes. That's what we are voting tonight on this the recommendation. recommendation to go to B's Act. For design. There's the motion. You want a findings of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking it. Oh, so, can we? Second. May I have a second? I think. I said second. Second. Uh, Kathy, will you please call the roll? Ms. Rose, sorry. And this is to recommend the zoning board with final design alternative. Yes. Correct. And he's delivered at a, at a special 9th, session. December 9th. December yes. Day. Special session on December 9th. Okay. December 9th. Mr. Scott. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks right. for your patience. No, no, I'm, it, I don't know if anybody wants to give me a ride home, but she took the car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. It's, it's Is there any further discussion? Any anything else for the board to discuss tonight? Good job. Bro. Thank you. No, I've got my teeth in, meaning my uh, so I'd have to like, you know. <laughs>